The meeting is now reconvened to open session. The board would like to remind the public that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. It is also available via live stream for the public through links found on the front page of the RUSD website. We would also remind everyone to please enter and exit through the lobby. The board met previously for closed session. Trustee Price, will you please read the action taken by the board? Yes. In closed session, the board voted to approve Kate Tweltridge for the position of Assistant Principal of Quarry, Tra Quarry Trail Elementary School, Coordinator Expanded Learning. The vote was unanimous. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, will you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now, item 6.1, CSEA President Chuck Haddix to present the CSEA report. Holy cow, that was fast. <laughs> good, good evening, President Hupp, trustees, and superintendent, and superintendent Stock. Um, on June first, we held a uh, we held a special uh, meeting with our union to ratify two items that we had. Uh, one of it was for nutrition service worker one, two, and three, and the other one the other ratification was for a maintenance worker three position. And that was a MOU in which they both passed unanimously. So I just wanted to bring that to the board. And then um, for future, um, on June 20th, we're supposed to be going into negotiations. And depending on if we end up being able to settle on a Me Too clause with negotiations or not, um, we're prepared to hold another special meeting to ratify that as well. And I've already explained that to everybody with the uh, teachers union settling on, on their things and everything, there was a lot of questions that come up. So uh, we're prepared and we're ready. So other than that, I'm glad to be here. Awesome, thank you very thank much, you. Chuck. Chuck, how goes the education? School. Oh man, are you, talk I, 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 are you talking about within the district or within myself? You, Chuck, you. <laughs> within myself, well. You. I was going to keep it under under the under the weather, but uh, <laughs> I have gotten my uh, certificate for project manager. Yay! It's, I, it's it's part of the uh, it's part of the associate's degree, uh, so I'm still working for the associate's degree. Um, I've currently doubled up on my classes, so I can hopefully get that done in half time. So I'm uh, my outcome of that is I'm looking to this time next year to have my associates, and hopefully in a year from that, my bachelor's. So I'm just, I'm just putting pedal to the metal and grinding, grinding that pencil and everything else, learning so much on the computers. I, I have, I've learned so much on the computers. It's fabulous, it's outstanding. So I can't uh, type everything in all caps anymore, Tony, and not know what that is. So I did not, what, I did not know, I just thought, oh, well, uh, I figured that you guys just didn't see what I was typing. So I, now I know what all caps means. So yeah, we, we had a good laugh at that one. Um, so yeah, I've doubled up on all my classes so I can get everything done in, in more of a timely fashion because I'm not getting no younger. So I gotta hurry up and get that education. Oh, so, thank you so much, Chuck. Yeah, thank and, you for and, sharing. And, and also bringing that up, um, this is probably gonna be the last meeting that I attend until August unless we have ratification votes that need to come forth. Okay, so, great. Thank so, you very thank much. You. All right, and welcome RTPA representative, Emily Thomas. Good evening, Superintendent Stock and members of the board. Cabinet, good to see you guys. I would say long time no see, but it hasn't been a long time. So just <laughs> good to see you again. Um, and I'd like to, to open on that note of having seen you very recently. Um, and that is to, to celebrate that the, the district and RTPA through uh, a lot of hard work 
and the key word is trust, and that's really what I want to talk about tonight, was able to uh, come to an agreement and uh, sign off uh, and ratify unanimously multiple TAs. And so we're, we're thrilled to be able to, to announce that. Uh, and I want to really emphasize that that celebration is possible because of the trust that members of RTPA have been able to build with members of the district sitting here presently, uh, both before and behind me. And I think that, that that trust is something that we've worked so hard to build, and it has really been uh, culture changing for so many of us, at least on RTPA's side. And I know that Dr. Limoges can speak to, you know, on his side, um, perhaps later in the evening. But I want everyone listening to, to just know that without that trust, there would be no progress made. And, you know, potentially there would be no contract and potentially we would be ordering new green shirts for the fall, um, you know, and, uh, and so it just feels, it feels great to be up here and celebrating such a positive step. And with that celebration, I would like to kind of encourage the board to engage in that process of trust that RTPA has found completely terrifying um, but also wonderfully rewarding. And, you know, the way that we built that trust is that, um, you know, I had to learn that I can't insert myself as the expert in every avenue because as much as I want to believe that I'm smarter than Barbara when it comes to the budget, the reality is I'm not. I'm a high school English teacher, right? And so when it comes to, um, you know, my job, I'm able to excel when I stay in my lane, and then I'm able to um, swallow my pride, which can get in the way a lot, and, and sit down and converse with Barbara and really appreciate the expertise that she brings to the table. Um, you know, and I think that all of the members of the bargaining team have had to kind of take that walk as well on both sides, where Tony can't walk into a room and, and try and be Travis and assume that he Tony, right, has all of the knowledge of the needs of the union members. So, so Tony has to really trust in Travis to bring forth what those needs in the moment might be. Uh, and it's, it's scary at times, right, because if someone misleads me, uh, I have put my name on a document that may or may not be valid. Um, but at the end of the day, we were never going to progress past picket signs and vitriolic comments at board meetings until we took that leap of faith and we trusted with each other. And so uh, where this is going is that I think that when the board can have that moment of vulnerability and create trust with our community, I think that great progress can happen within our district. Um, and, and when I say trust, I mean I encourage you to trust the experts in our classrooms. Trust our teachers to choose curriculum that best suits them. I was telling my daughter driving over here from, um, from swim team that because of the science curriculum that was rejected, uh, students will be reading a textbook next year that's over 15 years old and still identifies Pluto as a planet. And she giggled. I said, Mommy, Pluto's not a planet. Everyone knows that. That I know, and eventually our textbooks will also reflect that. And so back to the trust, right, is that if we can, if we can trust our teachers to, to share their expertise and to help be a guiding voice, I think that that, that would be truly beneficial. And since 2019, I believe, is when Derek and Rochelle um, you guys signed the six through eight Amplify science curriculum. Um, that's when we embarked on this journey of research and really digging deep into the K-3-5, pardon me, curriculum. Um, you know, and over those years, of course, COVID came in and, and slowed us down. Uh, but, you know, we also have had administrators who, in addition to teachers coming out of classrooms, um, you know, administrators had time off of campus, and if you've ever been on an elementary school campus where most of our elementaries don't have assistant principals, that one principal is, is filling many shoes, as many of you up here know, you know, being principals before at an elementary level. And so, um, 
you know, I worry that when we take administrators off campuses over the course of four years and we we encourage them to be involved in the textbook process and the research and the feedback, and then we reject what they have pushed forward, that we're not moving in a direction that builds trust and honors their expertise as leaders of our classroom communities. Um, we also have phenomenal district office personnel sitting with us here tonight. Also, you know, hopefully some are on vacation, relaxing a little, um, because they don't get the summers that some of us do. Uh, and we've had, you know, again, four years of those district office personnel needing to not be present in the office, not accessible to our community to respond to emails, not accessible to teachers who are looking for, for answers, whatever it might be. Um, you know, and then also we have amazing parents in this district and we sent out a survey for feedback and then we extended that survey from 30 to 60 days and you know the feedback was was positive and and again with all of that time that was put in by teachers administrators district office and our parents this decision was no um, and so i think that you know again i just wanted to come to you and say i celebrate tonight with the district and say rtpa and the district we built trust it was scary and we did have to make ourselves vulnerable but we have gained so much from taking that chance. And so I would encourage you, know, you the board, to, to start building or trying to, to build that trust with this community, uh, with all of us who are running this district day to day, in the classroom, at the district office, right, throughout all of the levels. Because I, I would say that you know, from, from my lens, it's, it's a confusing decision, and so I think that, um, you know, one way to, to clarify that would be to start having conversations with, with all these levels I've, I've listed tonight, because one thing that I think Barbara will tell you, and, and Tony laughs at me now, is that every stinking dollar matters. When we are looking at, at finances in a unified district, and we're trying to a bill for elementary schools and high schools and the funding is so different um, you know we don't have six figures to waste and that is what has happened um, you know you saw it in the board docs that due to needing to delay the adoption um, you know we could all look into what what a gallon of milk cost two years ago what it'll cost in two years um, but it's going to be at least a six-figure hit and those six figures could have, could have helped us hire multiple music teachers. They could have helped us hire many, many athletic coaches. I was speaking to a mom over at Parker Whitney, and her little kiddo loves theater, and they don't have money for a new sound system over there. So they rent the sound system from the church across the street. But right, I'm, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, six figures. We, we, we could have used that somewhere. And it doesn't have to be on teacher paychecks. Right? It could be, there are so many needs in this district. And so, um, you know, again, I think that, that building the trust, it made the bargaining process very productive for, for RTPA and RUSD. And so I really wanted to just come tonight and encourage that the, the board do, you know, whatever, whatever is that first step for each of you individually to explore, okay, how do I begin that, that that process of, of building that trust so that you too can be part of this, this progress because it, it feels exciting um, and it, it felt so great to leave school on, on Friday night after graduation and hug those students and wish them well and know that as I'm hugging coworkers, they get to just go home and relax. You know, they don't have to worry about whether or not we have a contract and what the paycheck is going to look like because. Um, because you know, due to trust and hard work, it, it's all settled. And so that's a really, a really beautiful thing, and I'm, I'm honored to be here tonight uh, to, to celebrate that with all of you. Uh, and then just because uh, Travis couldn't be here, there are a few things that I wanted to, uh, I guess, suggest. Um, I noticed that the public comment time got changed from the three minutes to the two minutes. 
Um, and I just wanted to throw out there a suggestion, and, and again, it's a suggestion because I'm not the expert, um, but I wanted to, you know, I noticed that we've had this great change where when people go beyond their three minutes, it just gets muted, right, which I feel like is really helpful for the president in that you're not trying to shush somebody, the microphone just goes dead. Um, you know, but I also know that a lot of feelings have been hurt by names being, being rather inadvertently or advertently, you know, who knows, dropped. And so I just had a suggestion of, um, you know, is it possible that if someone comes up and, and does name an employee or, or a student or, or whoever is going to be impacted by that media storm, you know, that potentially the microphone gets muted, right? And okay, whatever you had to share is done for the evening and maybe we can try again in two weeks. But just so that we all kind of feel like, okay, the board has set forth these rules. They've requested that we don't drop names. And so if, if we do break those rules, then if it's legal, right, maybe we could mute the person and then that way people don't have to be so afraid of what gets shared at board meetings. Um, and I think, I think that is really it for me. So thank you for, for your patience and um, thank you for having me this evening and I hope you all enjoy your summer. Thank you very much, Emily. <laughs> All right, so we now have um, item 7.1, 7 um, comments from board and superintendent. So trustees, do you have some comments? So this was my first time as a trustee being involved in all of the end of the year festivities and it was a really great experience. Um, I was able to go to a couple of events um, since the last meeting, um, the Newsies play at Granite Oaks and it was just really impressive. Um, the theater teacher who put it on, it sounds like a lot of just singular effort there, but then the students just the quality for middle school, it was very nice, um, really enjoyed it. I also got to stop over at Sierra Elementary and see their exhibition for their sixth grade projects. Um, they had to present those repeatedly as the different grade levels came through and they just did a really great job putting those together. As far as the graduations, um, you know, everyone kept telling me, you're gonna love it, this is the best part, and it really is. You know, you just in that, in that ceremony, you get such a great feel for each school's unique campus unity and culture, and just to see the excitement and to hear these students help encourage each other on to the next step of their lives um, was very moving, and I was very happy to be a part of it. Um, and then I also just wanted to touch on the um, ad hoc committee that Trustee Sathoff and I took part in along with superintendent stock and legal counsel to just talk about our board procedures for public comment. And I personally felt that it was a very productive meeting. Um, we were able to talk through a lot of, um, you know, different facets to that um, topic and we uh, were able to bring something to the agenda today. So thank you, that's all I have. Um, again, ha having a graduate and uh, being up there and watching them cross the cross the stage is is amazing. It's uh, it's funny you look back you look back on all the years. I remember walking them in as a kindergartner and you you transition. You go through all the different classes and schools and teachers and all that stuff. So uh, that was that was amazing. Um, amazing to see the middle school promotions, the high school graduations, the victory react. It was just as, I was, as, as Michelle was saying, as I said it before, this is one of the really great things about being a trustee. Like, you see those kids move on, everyone smiles, parents are happy, the kids are happy, just, it's nothing but smiles and greatness. I, I tease the city council guys, they get to cut ribbons and they get to flip dirt, but like, you don't get to go through an entire graduation the whole time. So that's, it's a really neat thing to, to see. Schools looked amazing, um, everything was out there, and then uh, being the good Whitney guy, we got recognized in, uh, in Placer County, uh, eight section champions, great athletic school, which was really nice. 
Um, both of our school, well, all of our schools do really, really well, but it was cool to see that. So hopefully uh, we continue to improve on that and we have great athletic competitions between the schools and great events and all of them. So just looking forward to next year. Awesome. Um, it was especially uh, special because we had four graduates between the three of us, and so that made it a, a really unique year for graduation ceremonies. And uh, like you said, such a great celebration of the year and um, how hard those kids have worked and how hard our staff has worked to make it such a, such a successful experience for them. And also uh, what our community has done and the thousands of dollars of scholarships that were given is really impressive um, how generous people are, and I really appreciated that. Um, also, uh, Emily, um, just wanted to make a quick comment that we have sitting in, since I sat in that chair yesterday, we, uh, yesterday, not yesterday, <laughs> last year, felt like yesterday. sorry, felt like yesterday, that's right. Um, we have such specific legal requirements, but we'd be happy to talk with you about that um, at any time, I'm sure um, any of us would be. And I think we'll have a chance maybe to um, discuss it, but we definitely are excited about our changes and, and our reasoning behind them. Um, also, uh, I'm really excited about the tentative agreement. So excited about the relationship and how things are progressing. It's been a really big priority of mine. It's um, Amazing to see the difference in attitudes and behaviors and culture and feelings and what that frees up for all of us to work more effectively. I wish um, you had been part of the labor management to see the work that Julie and I did as well as what we brought forth from representing the board. Um, it's, it's not just a start, it's continuing and we continue to be invested in that work and in those relationships and doing what we can. So I'm really excited for that, excited for our staff um, to enjoy the summer, right? Put their feet up maybe a little bit higher. Um, also, uh, just really appreciate the effort on those that are going to be working all summer, uh, maintaining things and um, making sure our technology is ready and all of our facilities and all those things. Uh, this isn't um, for them a summer off. So. Uh, thank you to Craig and all of your employees, Chuck, as well, that are doing so much. And I know Ryan and so many others that I'm sure I'd miss if I tried to call everybody out. But um, appreciate the efforts over the summer as well. So I know my uh, colleagues have already mentioned quite a bit about graduations. But I will say uh, something I loved seeing multiple Trustees have graduates at different campuses. I absolutely love that um, there's such a unity in Rockland. Uh, there's obviously a experience and excellence that we see across all of our campuses, but yet each campus had its own identity. And that was very clear by each of the graduations. And I love to see the differences. I even love to be able to celebrate each of our kids differently and individually. And so I just wanna say appreciation to every staff member, every teacher, every individual that had anything to do with that graduation, whether it was they were a kindergarten teacher of our children many, many years ago, um, or it was the individuals that were setting up and cleaning up the balloons at the end of the graduation. Um, that was, that was um, not only just immensely special as a parent of a graduate, um, but just to look around and see the parents and look back at photos this last weekend and see the parents um, that are in the back of my family photos, right, or, or, or the other students sitting there. It was just uh, very special to see each graduation ceremony really uniquely tailored to their campus. And I think that's something um, really unique that Rockland does have to provide, and I really appreciate that. Um, I didn't get to share before, but it was fun being out on some of the campuses um, for the elementary students as well. Um, I always love seeing the chicks demonstration um, with our kindergarten classrooms. Um, that's always a fun visit. Um, loved running into friends, family members, parents, and teachers that night and getting to see the many beautiful displays our teachers had in their classrooms. So thank you. I know that's not an easy night to prepare for, to have hundreds of families and parents on campus, um, but it's always fun uh, to see kids showing off their classroom and showing off their teacher to their parents. Um, I also wanted to just comment on the two ad hoc committees that I was able to sit on, Trustee Sutherland. It was really great to get to chat with you and talk and, and really look at how can we make public comment better. We heard some of that tonight. What can we do um, 
not to, to minimize down to the two minutes, but to actually give equality to everybody speaking. So whether you're, you're person number three or you're person number 23, you're still getting the same opportunity to speak before the board. And so that was really my heart. And my hope with that is making an equal experience for every person. Because um, some are coming from work. Some are trying to wrap up dinner before they can get here. Um, so I really appreciated Trustee Sutherland getting to work on that and getting to talk a little bit more um, about how can we meet the needs of requests that have come our way. And so I was very happy that we were able to find agreement together and be able to propose something that I think really works for our community. Um, additionally, Trustee Price, um, I enjoyed getting to sit on an ad hoc committee with you and uh, really being able to talk through how can we increase uh, parent participation in some ways uh, that works for our district and really getting to hear from Superintendent Stock how could this look in our district what makes sense because we're not the experts at all times and we we may have an idea but we don't know exactly how it can best play out and I actually think that's appropriate of the board to say hey here's an idea here's a goal um, here's a desire I have but how would it actually play out in the day-to-day -day? and and um, what do you see as hiccups or concerns or, or strengths or weaknesses to that so I appreciate uh, you both for sitting on that ad hoc we were quite busy amongst graduations and ad hoc committees the last couple weeks um, but hopefully that allows us to have things um, finalized and in a, in a place where our families, our teachers, our staff can enjoy their summer. I know not everybody has necessarily a quote unquote summer off. I know there are many that are still working in a ver variety of ways, um, but I hope that we are able to um, head into our summer and head into our fall strong and unified together. Um, I, I did want to reference um, a couple things I did here tonight um, that I do think is important for me just to mention. Um, I, I too am very appreciative of a tentative agreement. I don't take that lightly. I know that that's not an easy process. Um, and it takes, it takes a lot of trust, it takes a lot of collaboration, it takes a lot of relationship to be able to have a tentative agreement before we head into summer. And so I'm very appreciative of that hard work. Um, I, I did hear some comments tonight um, uh, that there is a, a desire for the board to begin building trust and to, um, to try to find ways to be a part of that process. Um, I, I will say I take it very um, sincerely as a trustee, my responsibility to be a part of the process of a tentative agreement. Um, we, we've spent several hours uh, really um, giving direction to um, the incredible leadership of our district um, that negotiates. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate for a board member to participate in the negotiation. Um, but I, I want you to know um, a tentative agreement is not something lightly, at least from me as a trustee. Um, extensive work has gone into that to ensure that the needs of our district are met, the needs of our staff, of our employees are met, and that they're compensated well. Um, and so it's been an honor to be a part of that process. Um, it's been an honor as a trustee to approve that tentative agreement um, and put forth that tentative agreement on behalf of the board. Um, so I uh, appreciate the comment shared and I agree um, wholeheartedly in working together and continuing to build that trust together. Um, and I'm excited for us to be able to celebrate together as trustees, staff, and uh, district leadership uh, the goal of finalizing that tentative agreement. Thank you. Okay, everything I had intended to say has been said. <laughs> That's okay, it's all good stuff, all really good stuff. There's no need to hear it from my voice. Um, all right, so we will now move on to item 8.1, the consent calendar, and we do uh, have uh, President, a... may I offer a couple of Oh, I am so uh, sorry. Just, I got just, totally... Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Skipped I, over you. I, I like efficient meetings as much as <laughs> you all do. Let me, and, let me, and, and, let me go back and do it right. Yeah. <laughs> Superintendent Stock, do you have some comments this evening? <laughs> um, I, I do, and like you said, there's so many great things that were said, and just, just also a reminder that... We are continuing to educate students in the summer. We open summer schools, uh, in, uh, summer school next year in our ELOP program, which is uh, a new program giving uh, students uh, nine hours of, of programming. And then of course our extended school year for students that, with disabilities that have that as part of their IEP. So we uh, you know, barely take uh, the week off and, and, and up and running again to serve kids, which is great. Um, also, um, 
Just again, thank you to, um, you know, appreciate the work of RTPA and, and, and to have a unanimous tentative agreement. I think that's the first time that I, I can recall that we had unanimous and I see a thumbs up. So that I think speaks to the trust, not just uh, between the teams, but also, frankly, uh, th that their membership has and the confidence of the leadership of RTPA to, to approve that. So, so very excited. Look forward to hopefully a unanimous uh, tentative agreement approval from CSCA when we get that agreement done. And, and, and then also um, the uh, other thing I would just like to note is um, on our um, classified uh, uh, action item under the consent agenda is a, a listed there as an employee who's retiring that's very uh, special to I know all of us and, and especially to me. And Brenda Meadows, who has uh, been the executive assistant for nine years um, and, and has uh, been just phenomenal service to me and is really just a dear friend and, and provide a tremendous support to trustees. I think 13 different trustees we were counting um, is, is retiring uh, and effective June 1st. And so we, we um, and it's due to unforeseen um, health issues that forced her into that. And so we just wish and, and pray for her and her family. Um, but we are so grateful for her service and, and friendship to, to so many of us. And I just needed to acknowledge that. Thank you, Superintendent Stock. Uh, I'm sure that we all are feeling that right now for Brenda. She will be definitely missed. Now we will move on to item 8.1, the consent calendar. And we do have one comment, uh, Tawana Armstrong. Uh, Tawana, you will have three minutes and welcome to the mic. Members of the dais, um, I know uh, Trustee Sadoff and Trustee Sutherland talked about the ad hoc committee along with um, Superintendent Stock with regards to the board um, policy and board comments. And I would just offer up, I know you're going to vote on it, it's probably going to pass with the two minutes. Um, as we think about and talk about uh, public or wanting parent engagement, community engagement, to go to two minutes if there's only 10 people to me. Um, maybe there's some leeway to allow, at least if it's up to 10, they get three minutes. And then after that, if it's more than 10, then everybody gets two minutes. Um, I'm just wanting to make sure that the community has an opportunity to participate. Just as you said, um, Trustee Setoff, those who take time to make their way to the board me meetings, who are listening and um, find themselves available to provide comments by Zoom, to do that and then to be prepared, two minutes is not a lot of time for those who do not consider themselves um, public speakers. And I know I'm, I'm one of those who's rambling right about now. I'm just wanting to make sure that we do not make the community feel like that we're taking away from them and their ability to be participants. We already have a question now with regards to parent involvement to say that we're now going to constrict meetings minutes to two two minutes to me seems that it um, somewhat takes away for parents to formulate their thoughts and then to deliver them. And by all means, if it's three minutes and they don't need the three minutes, we make that plain as well. If you can get your uh, message across very succinctly and you don't ramble like I do, then by all means, don't use the entire three minutes. Uh, those are just my comments. I, I would rather it be more minutes for parents' involvement so that we can make sure that it's captured as opposed to fewer minutes. So, thank you. Thank you, Twana. Okay, so um, all matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees, audience, or staff request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Any items removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Do any trustees wish to remove an item from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action? I would like to remove 8.7. Oh, 
Okay, Trustee Price requests to remove consent item 8.7 for separate discussion and action. Is there a motion to ap approve the remainder of the consent agenda items? So moved. Okay, first by Trustee Counter. Second. Second by Trustee Sadoff. Georgia, will you please call the roll? I did it again. It's the S. I was going to. Trustee Sutherland, sorry. <laughs> uh, Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Motion passes. So, Trustee Price, would you like to speak on the item you removed? Yeah. I um, I, I've spent a lot of time grilling <laughs> Craig, and he's been super helpful, and I just wanted to point out um, some of the things about this that are a bit frustrating is um, this is a portable that we paid 411000 for in addition an architect fee of 45000 and to move it is, um, let's see, I have it right in front of me, yeah, 500000 So I'm, I'm really concerned about um, the cost of that, especially because we have five portables that are going to be moved next summer as well. And um, we start adding up, and then how many do we have in the next few years after that? How many? White how houses? many portables? Do we have to in purchase? the next couple years? Well, uh, the, the the projecting to the five portables for next year um, would be pretty much the growth at Cory Trail right now uh, for the district. So every year, um, come August and September, we find out what the actual enrollment is, and then we work our way through the year and project if there's going to be a need for any more um, future classrooms and future student growth. Mm -hmm. But based on what we're seeing right now up at Whitney Ranch, Cory Trail would need the additional five portables for next year. But this board agenda is for the before and after school program. Currently, it's, it's a, a one and a half size portable, so it's 1,440 square feet, so it's about one and a half size of a normal portable classroom, which will house the Catalyst program that's currently in rooms 26 and 27 in the library, which Corey Trail needs to handle the growth for this coming year um, for the general classrooms and the special ed classrooms. So and I know you guys did a ton of work so that it's ready to go and you'd planned on this, which is awesome. I, I just want to call attention to um, how much it's costing, and I did ask Superintendent Stock, and I know you, know, you guys spoke about us working on these kinds of things in-house. Um, maybe look at sub acting as the contractor and contracting these out. And um, I just appreciate you guys looking into ways that we can save because this is a huge expense. Um, so I appreciate and, and, it. And we did. We actually uh, we bid the project. Uh, the, the first round came in a little high, and so we increased our bid solicitation. We worked with the architects and got on the phone and started calling contractors um, to to try and bid a, our project again. It's, Thank it's you. a tough time of the year when you when you bid a. a summer project and you go out in April, May, or June, um, contractors are pretty much locked in for the summer. Um, but you know, um, through our bid solicitation, our, our network of contractors and architects in the area, we we're able to get four contractors to bid it a second time. And then as we open up bids for the second round, it actually came in a little bit cheaper, which is good. Um, but as we did more uh, analysis and assessment of the why, because I had the same questions, um, I started calling around. And we're seeing these prices come in up and down the state for these portable projects that are higher than anticipated. Um, we think, one, it's the time, time of year uh, that we open up the bids. But we're also seeing that the electrical bids, contractors bid, their labor and material cost are still really high. That Those prices have not come down, uh, along with the timeline for delivery of their products. Um, this, this project also has uh, fire sprinklers that have to go into one portable. So uh, the state of California said we have to put fire sprinklers in there, so as, as you bring that into a classroom, there's a, there's a, a high cost for that also. So um, I yeah. think that we're, we're in higher than anticipated, but in line with what we're seeing up and down, as I call other districts, to try and find out the why yeah. it came a little bit high. Thank you. Thank you for your time and effort to do that. I really appreciate it, and also just for the additional discussion. Okay. So, uh, uh, and yes, I guess... I think it's more of a Roger question, but the uh, the after school programs, who runs those? Um, the uh, on all the other campuses, uh, Reef runs those programs, and that was part of a partnership that uh, Reef had with the city of Rockland when they uh, you who used to run them historically uh, decided they no longer wanted to, so they actually um, uh, 
uh, gave, uh, or not gave, they uh, uh, allowed Reef to acquire the portables that they used for the after school care program. And so Reef runs it on all the other elementary schools and they uh, they vendor with Catalyst kids that, that actually run the program and Reef owns the buildings and works to do that. It benefits our, 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 our families. Uh, Corey Trail was obviously just opened, and so there was not a pre-existing uh, city portable, previous city portable that Reef had. So in order to provide the before and after school care, we had to have the facility. So it'll be the same vendor, same program at all schools, but uh, this program is actually uh, a district versus a Reef program. Um, but the price point and the programming is, is exactly the same. And we know that working families depend on, on us, and some do, for us to provide that before and after school care. So uh, we, we, we make that available. And each school, I guess each of our elementary schools now, they all have those after school portables on their campuses. Right, and those portables are, are close to 20 years old or so because they were existing by the city. The city bought them originally, placed them on our campuses, provided, ran the before and after school program. And then when they chose to, like I said, to, to not do that, they uh, worked to allow Reef to acquire them, and now Reef runs the program. Um, and, and it's it's seamless. And But Quarry Trail, just we had to provide the facility. Fair. All right, anything else, trustees? Okay, so is there a motion to approve um, 8.7? So moved. Okay, first by Trustee Price. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> second by Trustee Sutherland. <laughs> uh, Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Motion passes. All right, before we move on, um, I would like to make clear an item that the board just approved on the consent agenda. It involves revisions to board bylaw 9323, meeting conduct. The changes are the result of the recommendations brought forward by the board's subcommittee composed of trustees Sadoff and Sutherland in conjunction with Superintendent Stock and the district's legal counsel. One of the revisions of this bylaw was that public comment will now be two minutes for all speakers. Whether you're the first or the last speaker and whether the item is an agenda item or a non-agenda item, the change will be implemented, implemented as of right now. Okay, now we'll move on to item 9.1. We will hold a public hearing for RUSD 2023-2024 Local Control and Accountability Plan. Hanna Anderson, Director, Innovation and School Programs. Set up over here today. Okay. Good evening, President Hub, trustees, Superintendent Stock. I am excited to be here before you tonight um, to present the local control and accountability plan for public hearing. Uh, as uh, shared, um, this is a follow up to previous uh, board meetings, most um, notably the one in May where we went over uh, in detail uh, the draft local control and accountability plan. Tonight I will just give a brief overview of educational partner input and overarching themes, share with you a budget summary of the uh, draft LCAP as well as a, an overview of our local indicators, the actions and services in this year's plan, as well as um, increased and improved services for our unduplicated students and present a few next steps. This year, we've had a great opportunity to listen to and work with many of our educational partners, from our board of trustees to our parent advisory um, group, our staff advisory groups. Um, and just last week, I um, held our last uh, consultation with our local SELPA um, to sign off. So we um, not only meet all of the legal requirements uh, when it comes to engaging with educational partners for our LCAP, um, we go above and beyond. So just to give an example, our, um, the legal requirement would be for our parent advisory committee to review the draft of our LCAP. 
Um, in, in our um, process, we truly try to engage in a collaborative process where we're working alongside each other and thinking about how can we truly hear the input of our staff and our parents and guardians to think about, um, as well as our students actually, to think about what in our programs is working for them and what in our programs can we make change to better serve our students. So we, next year, as we engage in a three-year um, rewrite of our plan, we will deepen uh, the opportunity to engage with our community um, and our staff, as well as our students, trying to hear from more um, of our members. This year, um, we have had a great opportunity to hear from them in a rewrite process, and a revision process. The overarching themes in the 23-24 LCAP remain the same as they have been um, in the previous two years. As a reminder, this is a refresh year, so this is just a re, uh, an opportunity to review and make any adjustments for the upcoming year. So the overarching themes stay the same in the area of mathematics, our focus on social, emotional, and mental health supports, as well as behavioral supports. The, um, the last two are to ensure that not only are we offering great programs, but we're thinking about how do we communicate clearly to all involved about our programs and make sure that there's cohesion um, between programs throughout the district, and then ensure that we're focusing on our student groups and closing achievement and wellness gaps for our students where we see um, different outcomes or experiences for students. Uh, this coming year, we are projected to receive about 5.1 million in supplemental funds. As a reminder, the LCAP, um, by law, we are required to include the LCFF supplemental funds. It's our intent in Rockland Unified to try to include as many funds as possible aligned to all of the actions. And that way we can be transparent with our community about how we're spending funds in alignment with the actions we're taking in our three goals. These funds that are listed on this slide as well as the next few slides, these are just talking about those supplemental funds. So these are funds that are generated because of the percent of students we have, or the number of students we have, who are socioeconomically disadvantaged students, our English learners, our students living in homelessness, and our foster youth. So we are projected next year to receive about $5.1 million in these funds. We are also projecting to carry over of almost $350,000. This carryover number seems a little high in the last couple of years. I want to just explain that um, briefly. Because of all of the COVID one-time funding that has cycled through, and we have been able to invest heavily in learning recovery programs and um, programs to support our students' social, emotional, and mental health needs. As a result of this, we have been able to um, invest first by using one-time dollars, and then it, it means that we might end up having carryover uh, in our supplemental funds that then will allow us to further invest in our learning recovery programs in the coming years. So all of those carryover dollars continue to fund those same actions within goal one on math improvement and within goal two on social, emotional, and behavioral supports. Continue that investment where, we, where it started. So that means that our total investment of supplemental funds um, to increase and improve services for unduplicated students is about 5.5 million, and you can see how it's aligned um, to the specific goal areas. So as a, um, just to restate this, $611,000 are for goal one actions, but there is a lot more of an investment that is being made using one-time funds other federal and state funds. These are just those supplemental funds. And inside of the LCAP, there are um, now five budget tables that are at the back of the LCAP for our community to dive in and have the opportunity to see how we're investing um, within each of those action areas. Also, where we invested last year and what we, were, what we spent in alignment with each action. So a lot of opportunity to look inside there. Um, along the, uh, alongside the LCAP, local indicators, which um, are presented in the California State Dashboard, those will be part of the uh, dashboard that's released in December of 2023. These local indicators um, go along with the state indicators. So the state indicators show our performance on CASP assessments, how our English learners are performing, how we're doing with attendance, suspension, graduation rates. These are those local indicators. So these speak to our conditions within Rockland Unified, and we work with our advisory groups as well as looking at our survey results and our California Healthy Kids surveys 
to identify how we want to place ourselves on these surveys, all, um, in these local areas. And so the attachment in attachment A um, provides what we will input into the dashboard in fall of 2023 that will be public in December of 2023. It is a legal requirement that I bring them tonight alongside the LCAP. They will also show up um, on uh, June 21st when I'm back at, um, for action on the LCAP. Our goals in the uh, refresh remain the same. First goal um, is to, in alignment with our math improvement efforts, and Director Davidson will be up in a little bit and share um, updates um, for goal one. Goal two gives uh, our continued investment in social, emotional, and behavioral supports. And goal three um, is to maintain, monitor, and enhance in this refresh year as, as shared in May. We will be diving um, a bit more deeply in a few areas within goal three, specifically on our attendance improvement, our work within special education, and our work to support our English learner students um, as we have many more English learner students who are at uh, beginning um, early levels of learning the English language and or are new to the country. So we have training that we'll need to invest in there as well as additional services for them. These next two slides I will not go into in, de in depth, but these provide um, just in alignment with um, some, uh, some of our action, or all of our action areas, but some of them are clumped together. Uh, how we're investing those supplemental funds. So I shared a few slides ago that our total investment was 5.5 million, and you can see that there. Um, I do want to highlight um, one piece here um, that is an increase. Uh, um, we definitely have an increase in our investment in English learner uh, students, which is here on goal three, um, as well as um, we have needed to reinvest in our technology loan program as the um, Chromebook um, ECF, um, not for Chromebooks actually, our Chromebook um, program will continue through the uh, ECF uh, funded program. Our hotspots, um, that program ended and so we do have families that rely on um, uh, RUSD for connectivity to internet to be able to access their instructional materials. We'll be partnering with a new um, a, a new T-Mobile program I'm very excited about um, to be able to not only provide hotspots to families, but it actually will be a hub of information where we can put up um, the social service agencies that we connect these families with when we're in consultation with them. And um, students and their families will actually be able to use these devices to connect into these services. And so when they contact us for help, they will actually have a device that can navigate them through that process as well. So I look forward to being able to share more of that service next year. I'm very excited about that change. Uh, these uh, increased and improved services were uh, shared with trustees in May. Uh, one to be highlighted here is um, earlier this evening, uh, trustees approved Katie Twelridge, who will be working um, part-time in an expanded learning role. One of her um, responsibilities will be to work on our tutoring program. Historically, we have had a very challenging time um, being able to offer targeted tutoring. We came up with a couple of areas this year where we um, had success using our learning recovery staff and asking them to tutor um, targeted uh, students. And so next year, I think we can build upon this small trial that we had this year um, and deepen this work. And so she'll be taking on that um, work as well as deepening um, our opportunities for parent education um, to our unduplicated students and running more parent university sessions. Um, so that's just one of the highlighted um, opportunities for increased and improved services coming up next year. So next steps, um, we will be responding to educational partner feedback on this draft LCAP. We will present um, the 2023-2024 the LCAP with the budget for um, board approval or board action on June 21st, and then subsequently submit it to Placer County Office of Education. They have already received a draft of our LCAP, provided non-substantive um, recommendations or suggestions to us. We'll continue to work with them. I don't expect any uh, issues um, with uh, that process. We'll communicate our plan uh, with our USD families, we'll continue to use um, the communication tools um, that are now uh, attachments in the LCAP. They are in the appendix area and um, communicate with our advisory committees next year and then continue to implement and monitor outcome data. 
Uh, at this time, staff request trustees uh, hold a public hearing regarding the draft 2023-24 RUSD LCAP and authorize staff to make necessary technical corrections that do not change the intent or represent a substantial uh, change to the program content. Thank you. Okay, trustees, are there any comments or questions? Just a comment, thank you so much for all the hours of work that have gone into this and um, to all of your staff and also the parents that have been on these committees. I know it's a big commitment, thank you. Ditto, a lot of work. Okay then, I now open the public hearing for the RUSD 2023-24 Local Control and Accountability Plan. I now close public hearing and we will move to item 9.2 and hold a public hearing for the 2023-24 district budget and annual certification for workers' compensation claims. Barbara Patterson, Deputy Superintendent, Business and Operations. Good evening, President Hupp, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. Uh, it's my pleasure this evening to present you with the district's proposed budget for fiscal year 23-24. <clears throat> uh, this presentation, again, is required for um, the public hearing, and this slide represents the uh, topics we will cover this evening. Uh, we are here in June. Uh, there are two required meetings, one for the public hearing um, for the LCAP and adopted budget, and then again for the actual adoption of both of those documents. So uh, we've built the budget on the governor's May revised uh, budget proposal, and um, there aren't a lot of differences this year between what the legislative houses um, are proposing versus the governor's budget as there have been in past years. Um, the main one that um, could affect Rockland Unified is the differences in the cuts um, proposed for the uh, one-time uh, block funding, the arts, music, and instruction materials discretionary block grant and the learning emergency, learning recovery emergency block grant. Uh, cuts proposed to the uh, arts and music uh, block grant uh, the governor increased the um, proposed cut since January from um, by one million to three point five million for Rockland Unified, and also in the May revise, he added um, cutting uh, to the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant by one point six million. Um, those two uh, cuts represent about a forty-two percent decrease in our original allocation of. Uh, $12.2 million. So um, we will be bringing back the final um, cut adjustment. Hopefully the Senate gets their way and there's no cut. But, um, we'll be bringing that final uh, back to you in the 45-day uh, budget revise. So uh, budget assumptions for each year presented in the multi-year projection, uh, which is, is, is part of the uh, SACS report attached to the packet um, are listed there by year. Uh, the major assumptions for 23-24 um, are listed here in the next three slides. And so <clears throat> I'm not going to read all these to you, but the um, COLA is 8.22%, uh, the funded COLA for um, the um, local control funding formula, our main state funding. Um, and um, we are using the average of the prior three years uh, ADA in that calculation, which, which helps mitigate our um, loss of enrollment. Um, but even, even with that, um, we're, we're looking at being funded at 11,232 ADA, which is 288 ADA less than this year. 
But with the application of the 8.22% COLA, um, there's still another, uh, an additional $7.2 million in state funding through that, that formula. And 347,000 of that is in new supplemental funding. Um, just want to point out that we haven't changed our, our teacher staffing ratios, so there's, those are the same as 22-23, uh, including the uh, staffing of uh, TK classes at 12 to 1. Uh, 1.2 million in um, salary costs for step and column on, for employees moving across the salary schedule is included. Uh, that's net of um, the known retirement savings. That's uh, about 0.7% uh, of our total expenditures. Uh, pension costs, again, are increasing. Uh, the STRS rate is staying uh, flat. The PERS rate is increasing by uh, 1.31% up to 26.68%. So the total increase um, for pensions is 1.1 million. That's a combination of the rate increases and um, increase in uh, staffing costs. Um, we have a preliminary number for our property liability insurance. We won't know the final until July, um, but we're projecting a $276,000 increase. Uh, Replacement for um, technology, um, that's increased from 100,000 to 600,000, and that's out of the committed funds that the um, board has committed. And then we've um, met the 3% minimum requirement for contribution to routine restricted maintenance, and that is um, 4.9 million. Um, since we have moved um, textbook adoptions um, for world language and some of the um, science grades from 22-23 uh, to 23-24, our instructional materials from this year to next year are increasing by about 1.6 million. And then um, finally, major assumption is our special education uh, contribution is um, projected to increase by $2.3 million. That's um, due to program growth as well as um, staffing costs, step and column. And also, we used uh, $1.2 million of one-time spending, um, mostly COVID funding for um, um, dispute resolution and learning recovery, and that's going away. And so that's also contributing to that increase in the contribution. Uh, the next two slides are just um, a summary of the uh, staffing adjustments from 22-23 to 23-24. These are our certificated um, staffing adjustments in RTP and management, and the um, staffing that was fun is funded by one-time funding is shown separately for your information. Included in, in these numbers is um, new staffing of 7.5 FTE for arts and music, and um, a 0.5 for an instructional coach to be paid out of the new Prop 28 uh, arts funds. And then uh, classified positions are confidential, non-represented, CSE and management. Again, these are to staff to um, establish staffing ratios and um, uh, one-time funding adjustments. One-time federal and uh, state funding, we have about $3 million still in uh, one-time uh, federal and state categorical and grant funding. Um, over half of that is the remaining of the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant. Uh, we have about $333,000, I'm sorry, $373,000 in ESSER three monies um, budgeted to be spent, all the other COVID one-time funding um, will have been spent by the end of this month. Um, unlike in Pat, the most recent um, state budget years, there are very few new state um, programs proposed and even fewer that will impact Rockland Unified. Um, uh, included is the ex um, continued expansion of TK, adding in another two months so February and March, um, students with uh, that turn five next February and March will be eligible to attend our TK program starting in August. That's funded, and then they continue to fund um, staffing at 12 to 1 in TK. 
And then as we spoke about the um, Prop 28 um, arts education programs, that's new for 23-24 funding. Um, we still do not know a lot. We're still waiting for a lot of guidance from the state. We don't even have a resource code to code this, so we had to make one up. Um, but we're um, still waiting on clarity. Um, we have, we, we don't even know what our allocation is going to be. We think we might find out in January. So based on the latest estimates, we think we're going to get about $1.4 million. But it is dependent on the total 1% of our Prop 98 allocation. So we'll keep you posted as um, information becomes available on that. So our projected enrollment <clears throat> is shown here along with our actual enrollment for this year. We currently are only 135 short of our projection for um, the starter school, which is, is good news. Um, the last two years, we've enrolled 235 kids and 301 students between during the summer. And um, so, but we also typically lose like 126 students between the, the day before school starts and the 10th day that we count students. So we do need to enroll more students to hit our numbers, but we do feel that our enrollment projection is attainable. So we do expect to meet our um, enrollment projection, which is what our, our budget is built on. Um, yeah. It, exactly. We've yeah. had a, uh, a, 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 a kind of, honestly, a bubble going through our system for, for a number of years where we do, as you said exactly, graduate more than we bring in. With the addition of TK, which will bring in uh, about 250-ish students, it, it, that actually helps add some in. So uh, beginning in 1516, Ed Code requires a statement of the reasons for the assigned and unassigned reserve, those are two pieces of our fund balance, in excess of 3% um, to be submitted to the County of Office of Education when we do our adopted budget each year. And so staff will submit this document on behalf of the district. Uh, the remaining balance in excess of 3% is projected at $11.9 million. And, um, so you can see all of the reasons that we've listed here as to why that is a good thing to have. Um, and just for context, um, one month of a payroll is $11 million. So that's just slightly over um, savings for, to cover one month of payroll. In addition to that requirement on the 3%, uh, the reserve cap uh, for the second year is um, in place, so for 23-24 uh, budget, the reserve cap, which is 10%, um, a reserve cap of 10%, no more than 10% in assigned and unassigned fund balance. So for committed funds, committed funds are constrained for a specific purpose by the highest level of the um, of decision-making authority, and that is you the board. And it's excluded from the reserve cap of the 10%. Committed areas must be identified no later than June 30th. However, actual amounts may be determined uh, after June 30th, but prior to issuance of the financial statements. So these will be adjusted um, with the 45-day uh, um, budget revision, as well as when we close the books with unaudited actuals. But the categories will not, will not change. So on this um, slide, these, none of these are new. These are continuing from 22, 23, but the um, amounts have been updated. And um, on this page, uh, we've talked about the reductions in the two block grants. So um, to continue the board approved plans in um, the programs that, um, we're being funded by those two block grants. Um, 
committed uh, fund balance has been included to maintain those um, at, at the to backfill the governor's proposed cuts. So if the, that amount changes, we will update those. Uh, increase in costs for special education services by uh, the Placer County Office of Education. Um, the SELPA funding model is um, changing. Originally, um, we believed, and, that, and there's going to be a hold harmless for 23-24 for the funding. And we thought that also applied to the bill back by the Placer County Office, but we found out that the bill back will impact will impact, uh, happen in 23-24. So this is the expected increase in bill back charges um, that didn't we weren't able to get into um, the expenditure in 23-24 budget. So we have it committed here until we can do that. Um, and then. Um, as discussed here also recently, the district has entered into tentative agreements with um, some of the employee groups. And so at the time the adopted budget was completed, uh, the estimated settlement cost of 4.7% is included and committed because it's not in the expenditures. Um, so, so the board has committed the estimated cost here until the agreements and costs can be presented and incorporate in the 23-24 budget. And then, uh, and do the need to prepare the AB 1200 bargaining disclosure documents for the county on those settlements? Um, and to update the proposed adopted budget, the estimated deficit spending in subsequent years for those salary committed um, are, are, for those salary costs are committed here as well. And then finally, the last item is um, committing fund balance for, to mitigate the impact of declining enrollment as it works through our three-year average of funded ADA in the local control funding formula and also to help mitigate um, the decrease in actual daily attendance. And hopefully we'll see those numbers go up with our committees working on that next year. Uh, this is another way of looking at our um, ex revenues and expenditures rather than in the summary format in the multi-year projection. So uh, as you can see, 79% of our funding comes from the state's local control funding formula. And it's based on average daily attendance. Only 2% of our funding is provided by the federal government. 10% is from other state revenues such as grants lottery, special education, and 9% is from local sources. Again, it's another piece of special ed, the apportionment coming through the SELPA, uh, lease and facilities use, interest income, donations, and such. 82% of our total expenditures are uh, projected to be spent on salaries and benefits. The remaining 18% is for all the other costs of the district's operations, such as utilities, insurance, supplies, services, equipment, and facilities repairs. This is the multi-year projection showing just the unrestricted portion of the, of the budget. Um, as you can see, there currently is no projected deficit spending in um, the unrestricted portion. This will change once we add the cost of the tentative agreements for the salary increases for employees in 23-24, and this will be updated in the AB 1200 bargaining disclosure report that will be presented at the next board meeting. Um, the, that deficit spending, again, um, has been addressed and covered early in the earlier slide on um, the committed fund balance. And then the combined general fund, this is what we actually submit with the uh, reports to the county office, the entire general fund. This um, first column is our estimate actuals for this year. Second column is our adopted budget. And then um, you can see the uh, estimated reserve for economic uncertainty is projected at 9.7% at the end of 22-23. Um, this excludes all the other components of fund balance. Total fund balance is projected to be $46.9 million at the end of 23-24. And I um, want to say that as we've discussed 
before, adequate reserves are a cornerstone of financial stability. Reserves provide options to respond to unexpected circumstances and provide a buffer when faced with fiscal challenges. They protect the district from changes in state funding, either from economic volatility and or continuing declining enrollment, as well as from unanticipated increases in expenditures. Uh, the projected deficit spending shown in the two future budget years on this slide are due to restricted one-time expenditures. So in other words, we're spending down one-time restricted um, funding sources. Along with the governor's May revised proposal, the budget and multi-year are also based on decisions already made by the governing board, uh, industry standard economic assumptions, and district trend data. These are the major areas that can affect the adopted budget each year. Uh, the changes in the state adopted budget from the governor's May revised proposal, and this can carry through all the way throughout the year. Um, it includes the COLAs assumed in future budget years that um, is determined by the Department of Finance, and those will be updated again in January and also in next year's May revised. So that can impact our multi-year projection. Um, as we've talked about, special ed funding and program costs are dependent on number of students in the program, their disabilities and needs, and the cost to address their educational needs. Enrollment and attendance, including which grades the students are attending, that all affects our funding per ADA. And then savings due to positions being vac vacant for periods of time, and hiring placements that vary from budget assumptions those will all have an impact on actual revenues and expenditures. Currently, the greatest uh, risk to the budget is um, the uncertain future of the economy. Um, and this includes not knowing the actual 2022-23 tax revenues um, due to the extended tax filing deadline. We won't know that until mid-October. Um, also, as you can see here, um, there's a list of, we still are having supply chain issues and bottlenecks which um, exacerbate our inflationary pre um, pressures and um, the volatility of the stock market creates uncertainty and risk for the economy and for the state general fund because of our over-reliance on the state's wealthiest residents. The Federal Reserve actions, we don't know if they're done in raising interest rates and that could cause a that could have an impact and cause a recession. And then currently the unemployment rate is low, but if it increases, this will have a slowing effect on the economy. So next steps, as um, Ms. Anderson stated, we'll, we'll be bring back the local control and accountability plan and adopted and uh, the budget for 23-24 for your uh, approval on June 21st. The state is expected to have an on-time budget, so we should know sometime in June what the final state budget is. We will submit the, um, the budget by June 28th to Placer County Office of Education, and then um, we will revise the budget within the 45 days as required um, once we know the state adopted budget. Um, I want to thank so many of the people for their extraordinary efforts this year in developing this budget. This was, um, everyone worked collaboratively to put this together. And so I wanna thank, you know, site principals and admin staff, um, all the operational HR and educational departments, and a special thank you to my business department for all their hard work. So at this time, um, I ask that you open the public hearing for um, the district's budget and the workers' compensation claims. Awesome, and thank you for all your hard work, Barbara. So much goes into it. Um, trustees, are there any comments or questions? No, just again, echo the thank you. There's a lot of factors in your models, a lot of different pieces, a lot of percentages, a lot of guesses, a lot of estimates that you have to revise, and then you think you got it right, and you revise it again. So I thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, your, your staff, your team. Like, like, There's a lot that goes into it, and we sincerely appreciate it. And I think that's one of the reasons why you know 
our, from a budget standpoint, we are doing so well as that hard work. So thank you very much. Okay. I now open the public hearing for the 2023-24 district budget and annual certification for workers' compensation claims. All right, I now close the public hearing and move to item 9.3, action on district adoption of grades nine through 12 science materials. Marty Flowers, Associate Superintendent, Secondary Education. Good evening, President Hutt, trustees, and uh, Superintendent Stock. Um, <laughs> uh, before I get started this evening, just uh, want to give a shout out to the trustees who actually had graduates this year, and I also appreciate you recognizing all the hard work that goes into those graduations. Uh, again, thankfully, Mother Nature helped us out this year, and so it was a beautiful evening at all three of our high schools. So, with that, I come before you uh, this evening uh, with our 912 Science. Uh, just to remind you that in, at our April 19th meeting, I uh, did a presentation with my colleague, Bill Kimmel. Uh, I wanna start this evening just by reviewing some of that material before moving forward with our recommendation. That evening, we talked about our curriculum adoption process, where it starts at the state level, where publishers create those frameworks, and then where districts go through a, a process uh, to adopt curriculum. Uh, also included that evening was our science adoption timeline. A reminder, this looks like a lengthy timeline, if you look, though, at the beginning of that, the State Board of Education adopted the Next Generation Science Standards, and then it took them five years to create the instructional materials. We got started with this, and then COVID hit. We resumed that in the fall of 2022, 20, uh, and then you see the last two items here. I come before you this evening in June, uh, excuse me, and um, yeah, in June, and then once again, if approved, yeah, it's been a busy month. If approved, we'll move forward. Uh, again, we, we talked at length about this is the first time that Rockland Unified has looked at open educational resource. Uh, again, these are free uh, access to instructional materials. Uh, there's many benefits. Our, our surrounding districts use open educational resource, but one of the things I want to make clear this evening is that we take this material and our experts, uh, and again, I want to give a shout out to all of our science teachers for, for their ongoing efforts to, to create our own version of this. We do not accept all of it. We basically take what's available, we adapt it to our curriculum, to our assessments, uh, to meet the standards uh, presented to us. Uh, with that, this is our first time, and I just wanna make clear that, that um, CK12 may go on and provide updates, but what we are adopting tonight is final. Uh, we will review those updates, but before any of that becomes officially part of our adoption, we will bring that forward to ensure that the board and all uh, uh, stakeholders uh, are able to review that before we adopt it into our, what we call our flex books, just digital textbooks. So again, uh, one of the main things about that is we're not spending uh, $270 on a science textbook. Uh, we're, we're building this, there are some printing uh, and some time dedicated to that. However, we can use a lot of those monies to really enhance those hands-on experiences that we all look so forward to. Um, finally, uh, all this must comply with the California Ed Code's requirements in, uh, around instructional materials. Not to go over all of this, but again, uh, it was extensive work by our committee, three days to review those open educational resources, to identify the CK-12 uh, flexbooks, to develop the curriculum that aligns with that, and then to pilot this. And that, a pilot took place in the spring of 23. Um, when we did our parent information night, uh, they actually pointed out, and I'd failed to, to recognize this, but if you look up here, the first one to the left on our biology book, they took great pride in, in recognizing that that's a wildcat. And then there's lightning, and then, you know, with lightning, there's thunder. So uh, they pointed that out because I did miss that the first time. Uh, so uh, with that also, they developed uh, really a unit of study. Uh, all this material is available online. Uh, going over that public review process, uh, we created a website um, that was available. 
We informed parents via email through our uh, RUSD newsletter and actually sent postcards home because we wanted to make sure everyone was aware of this. Uh, everyone had digital access to this on our district web page. Again, for the science, uh, with our new next generation science standards, all that, we did hold a parent information night in this room on May 10th. Um, and then trustee emails were made available to collect feedback. With that, our next steps, uh, there were no adjustments requested. If the curriculum recommendations are approved, once again, we'll move forward to purchase those items and get those delivered to sites. We will work on the professional development on the new curriculum, and then we will uh, provide ongoing support. And with that, trustees, staff recommends approval of the 912 science curriculum as presented. Thank you very much. Are there any board comments or questions? Yeah, for just, yeah just looking ahead, and I know or you do a great job every January. We talk about all the new classes. Would this be something that about that time, if we would, and again, I don't, I don't want to make changes and then make change again next in January of 24, but is that about the time when we would look to make our planned edits? Just because I'm thinking the format, we're already talking about the other sure. the new classes. Would, does that currently, line up? Or? Currently, the plan is to, to work through this throughout the entire school year and then really look at any of those updates. But again, that is the benefit uh, of a flexbook. If there is something so significant, I'd be happy at the request of working with the teachers to bring that forward. But again, I want to ensure that nothing will be included until it goes through and is brought forward. Sure. Sure. This is also something I, I do my own uh, PLC with our high school districts. And since they have used this, I will work on their experiences to see what they have done, because they uh, are very helpful. I just wanted to thank you for that point of clarification. Um, I know sometimes we get between meetings the ability to have conversation. Um, I know I had a parent that attended the Wednesday, May 10th um, information night, felt like that was a great night. They were able to really look through everything, get their questions answered. Um, and they too were kind of, okay, so how does this unlocking locking mechanism work? I think we can see great strengths with that, right? I think it's a, a, a great idea for many, many reasons, um, but I appreciate you mentioning what you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Um, I know it wasn't written in on the slides, but just highlighting that again, um, as a trustee, I would just say only if there's a need, right? Uh, there may not be a need. If there is a need, I think that's great, but good to know that what we approved tonight um, will be the curriculum that will be used, that will be seen. Um, but of course, as you guys utilize it, if you feel a change needs to happen, I do think that's a phenomenal mechanism. And great for parents to know that that will just be brought back if an addition or a change needs to be made. So thank you for clarifying that locking, unlocking. I think I only got a few concerns about that, but I, I think they were valid concerns of, so how does this work? A student unlocks it, locks it, what's going on here? Um, so thank you for taking the time to address that tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Mr. Kimmel happened to give his presentation on a busy night and answered all of our questions. So just a um, public thank you again to him and to all of your work on this. Um, yes, thank you so much. It, it's actually very impressive to look through how it's all set up. Um, and I appreciate you, you know, sharing the feedback. Students, by and large, very much seemed to be in support of it, thought it was just right as far as difficulty, thought it was helpful. I did notice um, in areas that maybe, you know, weren't as good, the simulations. And I also noticed that the teachers mentioned that the simulations are helpful, but they also can be um, less helpful. Mm -hmm. are, are those simulations, I was kind of looking through and I saw a link, but it looked like it just kind of went to more of a general website. Um, is that maybe just needing more time, more training on how to, how to present those? Or have you gotten more feedback on that? Yeah, um, I have not received more feedback on that. I know not all of our teachers participated. So, um, you know, the feedback you received were from the teachers who participated. But, but one of the things I want to point out that all of our high school teachers, not only do they use the adopted curriculum, they also supplement uh, in areas. So similar to maybe a, a, a hardbound textbook, there's some areas that you may want to go in more detail that's not provided in that. That's where they supplement, and that, that's where I'll continue to work with them and, and support them. And again, I want to give a shout out to our program specialist, Amanda Bannister, who's here. She did not have to be here tonight, but she is, as you can imagine, dedicated hours 
to this process, so she was interested to see how it went through. Uh, but that's something we will go back and review. And, and again, we will provide training at the beginning of the year so all teachers understand exactly how to use each one of them, what works. Um, and in addition to that, I'll also say this is, this is truly the first time that our two high schools have come together to collaborate and create uh, a consistent program. And, and um, once again, we always like to compete against each other on the field. Uh, but we all live in, in Rockland and work in Rockland Unified, and that's where it was beneficial to see them working together, just bouncing ideas. As Mr. Kimball said, he's, he's uh, 29 years teaching science, and he's getting that information, but he's also learning from his colleagues additional information. But uh, I could definitely follow up on that to see, to ensure that they all feel comfortable with those simulations and see if they have to add to that. Okay. Um, I also just wanted to check in on just the parent involvement piece for this. Um, we did do the postcard that went out, had the parent information night, um, which, yeah, I mean, not many came, but I think that that's okay. I think having it available, because it could vary depending on subject matter. Um, but I wanted to just check in on that and make sure that everyone feels good with where we are. Um, because of you know some of the comment you know that Emily Thomas made and that we've received since the elementary science in just clarity of you know how we make the decisions here and I think most people understand but in case some don't you know we really the discussion occurs up here and I am fairly new to this the previous you know going over the science was somewhat new for me, so I want to make sure just that we cover everything before we go to a vote. Um, and so with the parent involvement, you know, I kind of went through emails um, that most of us received, some didn't, and I actually, if I received emails, I kind of sent them, you know, said, maybe you should send this to everyone, you know, because it's good. Um, but we did receive, you know, Many emails, um, I counted 30 for the previous one. I received five for this high school one. We had some you know, public comment on the previous elementary. We didn't have any come in here for the high school. Um, there were a handful that came to Info Night, and then there was a petition that went around. So I'm trying to figure out with this Ed Code 60002 to make sure that that this is in alignment because to me it all seems very similar with what happened previously and what happened here. And the ed code doesn't specify any difference depending on primary grades, secondary grades. Um, so I wanted to see if everyone felt good about it. I wanted to check in specifically on the process for getting parent feedback. With the elementary, we had a form an electronic form. With this, we have the emails. And I wonder if this format actually inhibits parent participation because it's more difficult. Um, you have to kind of go and take the extra steps. It's not a form. I would want to suggest to the board that we consider going back to a form so that we all can see the information, we may need to make adjustments so that we receive it in real time rather than at the end when we don't have a lot of time for review. But I think for us to function well, as much as we can have the same information in front of us and that same knowledge base so it's not, well, my people came and said this, well, my people called me and said this, can we look at doing something like that to help further this cause and make it more consistent. And that also allows you, Dr. McDonald, Superintendent Stock, to have access to that as well. Because given the work that you guys put into this and overseeing it, um, otherwise what I'm understanding is then you're kind of just dependent on us um, to get that information. Superintendent Stock, is there something you wanted to address? 
Um, no, I, I was just going to just address that the process used uh, for uh, this uh, item and, and the previous item uh, all met Ed Code requirements um, for public review. Okay, are there any other comments or questions? Okay, we do have one public comment. Would like to come up to the stand. Thank you very much, Mr. Flowers. Um, as you come up to the stand, please state your full name, the city you live in, and the school your children attend. And there is just one, and it is Teresa Landon. Um, I just wanted to urge the adoption of the high school science curriculum. My daughter was a freshman this year at Whitney High School. Um, she thoroughly enjoyed her whole experience there. Um, I can even, you know, I could go on and on about what a great um, job they did um, incorporating these different materials using phenomena based um, lessons and units to kind of get them all very engaged. Um, so I just urge that this be approved tonight. Um, just piggybacking off of hearing the discussion regarding the CK-12, they, I know they, from personal experience, they have excellent um, resources and trainers that come and you know, show how to use the animations, the plixes is what they're called and such, um, and I've been a part of some of those and they're excellent. So I, I assume that they'll be amazing um, professional development for our teachers. Um, and then my only, I think, constructive criticism would be um, just from a parent perspective, just um, moving forward, you know, using um, the use of common assessments to analyze the progress of what students are learning and how they're learning it and when they haven't learned so we can always keep moving forward and addressing those things. Um, I know there was a little bit of inconsistency, um, at least at um, my daughter's site, regarding um, who got a final exam and who didn't, and that's something that I know it takes a long time to develop common assessments, and I understand all the hours and hours of work that have already gone into this, but I'm sure that would be an excellent goal for the future. So thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you for coming out and being a part of the process. Okay, trustees, is there a motion to approve the adoption? Did you have another comment? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I just, I know typically I think the first part is for questions, right? And I heard a couple different questions. And then I, so I just thought, I just had a few thoughts on it that I wanted to share just publicly. Um, uh, just because I, I, I was hearing, I, I'm assuming there were questions for your colleagues um, as a team. And so for me, a couple things, um, I think later in the night when we get to look at the revision to board policy on, I believe that's 9.5, I think that sufficiently solves some of the concerns that I publicly shared before. So that will address most of them for me. Um, regarding this, I did want to say a specific thank you. I was concerned about parent involvement. I had shared that with the past decision we made. Um, in speaking with our secondary um, teams, um, I, uh, a, a suggestion was made to me that they felt a postcard in this instance could um, possibly meet that, and they asked that I try that and be willing and open to that, and so um, I agreed to that and said, I, I do feel for me secondary and elementary is very different. I think in many ways a unified district is phenomenal. Um, I speak with many other board members that are not in unified districts and they wish they were. Um, however, I do think that as a trustee, there's a responsibility to, to look at third graders differently than 12th graders for me, and so I do think those processes need to look a little different when it comes to um, how we increase parent involvement, but I will say I appreciate um, the suggestion to me of how we could increase parent involvement in this process. Um, so I did want to highlight that as a thank you for me. Um, and then also just um, to highlight again uh, that I do see this a little different. Uh, again, I see ninth through 12th grade very different than third through fifth grade. Um, and so I uh, look forward to action item 9.5, um, but specifically in regard to this, um, I felt the questions I was able to ask, I felt um, the parent concerns, which were very, very minimal, um, that were brought to me on this were actually answered um, and addressed fully. And so I don't have concerns with this moving forward. Thank you. Did you have any um, thought on the comment form versus encouraging individual emails? Or does anyone else? I don't think that's our decision. I think that you can 
I'd probably be able to talk into this. I don't think that's our decision as a board. I think you can make that suggestion to Superintendent Stock as something as for them to consider right with the protocols. Am I correct on that? Um, we, we always uh, can look to uh, evaluate different processes. And um, prior to beginning uh, any new adoption process, we uh, would, would brief the board prior to uh, make sure that the process uh, being used fully meets the input that they would like to have when they are uh, considering an action item. So given the um, uh, w uh, degree of interest and conversation regarding uh, uh, this adoption and other adoptions, we, we will always work to look to be better. And so we one of the commitments we've made to the board is to ensure that we brief the board fully on process prior and different input opportunities to make sure that when we have a recommendation that, that all the information the board seeks uh, will, will be uh, accumulated uh, for them to make a decision. So we'll, we'll continue to work as we move forward. So then would that be something that would be included, say, in the initial presentation, say, like when Bill Kimball had originally presented, it would include that parent review period and how we were going to be collecting those responses and we would discuss it at that time? Uh, we would, that would be a, a part of the, uh, the, the public input process would be presented in that information item. And, and then even prior to that, we would work to inform the board, um, you know, like a, kind of in a board scheduling of we plan to bring these things forward this year. Here's some pieces. And then we would, uh, in, in the information item, share how input will be gathered um, in ways that will uh, occur, because that typically commences our, our required public review process. So um, whether that be emails, whether that be an online form or, or, or a, another means, we would, we would disclose that at that time so the public would know what to expect and how to engage. I would be happy to speak to that on this, though, too. Um, uh, Trustee Sutherland, I have found for me that um, individuals engage with me in different ways, that there are times that some individuals uh, prefer to engage via phone um, more in the recent. Um, I have had more parents um, feel more comfortable communicating with me via phone or over a coffee. Um, and so I do think that it's good to look at how do we continue to increase opportunities for individuals to connect with the board. However, um, I do think making all individuals' comments comments um, fully public. I don't know that that's always fully appropriate because um, for me personally, in the last um, recent decisions we've made, I have had many, many individuals reach out to me via phone that did not reach out um, via that um, public comment forum. Um, so for me, I feel that there are a variety of ways that individuals can get a hold of us. And so I just wanted to highlight that just because somebody doesn't utilize a form uh, doesn't mean they're not communicating and conversing with the district or with board members. Right, I understand that. I just believe that it's more transparent and it gives us more information so that we are not then up here debating whose community says what. We at least know it's not going to be perfect, but like I mentioned earlier, when I received emails about the elementary curriculum and it was only sent to me, I said, I think you should share that because I think that's how we're going to be able to collaborate and have a productive dialogue is if we can come in with that information. No, it won't always be perfect, but to have a process that we offer to say, yeah, you can talk to me individually, but if you want this to be taken into consideration by you know, Marty Flowers, Bill McDonald, Roger Stock, and all of us, I would encourage you to, to use the process. Absolutely. I think that um, moving forward, the hope is that implementing the new language in 9.5 will kind of even go in the beginning rather than, because I think one of the problems we're talking about is the problem that we're hoping to correct by implementing the new language in 9.5 so that we can be getting parent input before all of this happens and parent decision making, not just parent input. Because I think part of the problem with the way we've done it in the past is that I would even say input because it wasn't effective if it was after everything's already been done. So I think 
bringing parents into the beginning and having them be a part of the decision making and not just part of the, hey, like what you did there, or hey, I don't like what you did there, I think is going to kind of solve part of this problem before it happens, if that makes sense. So hopefully moving forward, this won't even be an issue because we're going to have parents who are actually choosing and making those decisions in the beginning. For sure. Okay, anything else, trustees? Okay, yep. Um, all right, so is there a motion to approve the adoption of grades 9 through 12 science materials? So moved. First by Trustee Price. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Counter. <laughs> I, I won't call you <laughs> Trustee Sutherland, I promise. <laughs> Um, George, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Motion passes. Now on to item 9.4, action on district adoption of world language for French, Mr. Flowers. This is going to look very familiar. Uh, so moving right along into the world uh, language uh, uh, French again at the April 19th meeting. Just a quick review of that. Uh, this is a similar slide I will move through. Uh, the, the timeline does look a little bit different as the State uh, Board of Education adopted in January um, 2019. The standards, they moved quickly. Um, our, our process started. Here we are in June requesting board approval. And once again, if approved tonight, we will move forward with training and implementation of the curriculum. Uh, to go over the, that French work, uh, spent one day on the standards and framework, two days reviewing the curriculum. They identified a pilot curriculum. We piloted in fall of uh, 22. And again, further evaluation of the pilot, uh, including student feedback. Um, once again, I did not take French, but I believe it's uh, pronounced Shamaz. Um, did I? Pretty close. All right. That's okay for, for me. So um, the uh, public review process were very similar with a, a website. Again, parents were informed via email, the newsletter, and postcards. Digital access is available on our webpage. Uh, trustee emails were made available as well. Uh, next steps. No adjustments were uh, requested if uh, adopted tonight. Um, we will purchase and deliver those to the sites, provide the professional development and ongoing support through our very own Ms. Bannister. And uh, at this time, staff recommends approval of the world language curriculum as presented. All right, thank you very much. Are there any board questions or comments? No <laughs> All right, we have no public comment. So is there a motion to approve the adoption of world language for French? So moved. Second. Okay. First by Trustee Counter, second by Trustee Sutherland. Georgia, we please. I don't, my goodness. I don't know what it is. It's the S. <laughs> Trustee Sadoff. <laughs> George, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. All right, 9.5, and we have Mr. Flowers again. Please continue <laughs> with action on revision to board policy BP 6161.1 on selection and evaluation of instructional materials. President Hupp, trustee, Superintendent Stock. Uh, previously, trustees requested that Superintendent Stock work, work with a board subcommittee to bring forth a recommendation to revide, revise board policy 6161.1 to require parent participation in curriculum adoption committees as a new recommendation for the board to consider. Board policy 6161.1 has been revised to reflect that request from the board. Additional revisions reflect updates to the board policy as advised by the California School Board Association since the la it was last revised in 2015. Revisions, updates, deletions, additions are a result of legislation change in Ed Code, Government Code, and Civil Code. 
Uh, with this, staff recommends approval of a revised board policy 6161.1. All right, are there any board comments or questions? Yes, so I do have questions um, related to how, so I read through this, I know some of it were some language changes from the committee, some are uh, maybe CSBA approved um, updates to this. What I wanted to see, so I, I see that we have a section here about the board must select instructional materials for use in grades K through eight that have been approved by State Board of Education or that have during the district's review process been determined to be aligned with the state academic content standards adopted pursuant to ed code. Um, and then we have the board must adopt instructional materials for grades nine through 12 upon determining that the materials meet the criteria specified in law and the accompanying administrative regulation. So that specifies, you know, two separate paragraphs here for different grade levels, but what has come up multiple times following the vote for the third through fifth grade science was this idea that it's different for elementary versus secondary. And I don't believe that that piece has been defined and explained. And I've been asked, and like I mentioned before, my answer is I have as much information as, as you. If we don't talk about it up here, that's, that's what's been discussed. Um, so I really am hoping that we can take this opportunity because I do think that this update is important to make sure that we really figure out what this is going to look like and what is going to be required so that when teachers bring a recommendation to the table, we don't end up in a situation like we had. Um, so I guess, First, my, my biggest question is just, how is it different? And how are we going to use this change in language to address it? Sorry, I'm asking a procedural. Typically, this is questions right now, and then after public comment, we uh, can give our well, answers. Well, I guess, or? I mean, do you, do you have input on that, or should that just wait for just us? I've, I just am wondering, was this part of the, dis the discussion? Because I know this just seems very vague. Um, if not, it can totally wait. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll answer a, just a clarifying question. Uh, it, it, it was asked just now, as, part, as working with the subcommittee, um, is that the fo conversation focused on the parent involvement in the process piece, um, and, and that was the um, focus of that discussion. Um, that, that there was uh, not a lot of, there was not, and so that was the focus of the revision that, that was made that's outside the California School Board Association revised policy. Was, but was there any specific discussion on differences between primary and secondary? Uh, th there weren't discussions related to that in the, in the subcommittee discussions that I was part of. It was focused on the parental uh, in involvement in the process. Can I jump in on that because I was on the ad hoc committee. Is this okay at this time or do I need to wait? Uh, the, the the board is, I mean, accord, uh, is it permitted to dialogue with, with itself with uh, any point on this item um, as the president uh, facilitates. Um. Okay, thank you. I just think it's silly to have to wait when I, I sat on that committee, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I hear you, Michelle. I think I hear what you're saying. So the, the direction given to me in regarding the policy was that as a board, we want to be careful that we are not giving so much specific in a policy that the execution of it, they're not able to look at the differences between the secondary and elementary. So the policy here that we're voting on tonight was specifically how do we include some of the concerns that were mentioned at previous meetings 
questions about parent involvement and make that clear. Um, and then it opened up some dialogue about a few other areas. So I actually wrote down just to share publicly, because sometimes the jargon in here, like I even got lost in it a couple times and was like, okay, help me understand why is CSBA recommending this? Does it meet the needs I had? I felt like it met the needs and the concerns I had, and I'm gonna point out a few of the reasons why it's different than what we had before. Um, specifically, uh, the section, I believe it's the second page where it goes into the ed code 60002. Um, so what was important and critical to me was that there, that it, it states in here, must involve teachers substantially, which that box was checked for me, must include participation of parents, shall encourage participation of community members, and then it ends the sentence, it was very important to me how it was worded, in the recommendation of instructional materials for board approval. So all three of those parties are included in the actual recommendation made to the board who will then make the decision for approval. Um, because I think to me before how the verbiage was, it was very confusing. So those four points uh, checked boxes for me of what felt different, although that's no different than what Ed Code 60002 actually said. Um, the, the legal attorney said, well, yeah, you're saying the same thing, but it made it more clear and, and called out those four points. So we don't have confusion later as we have our processes. So essentially all three of those boxes have to be checked in the recommendation of the instructional materials given to the board for board approval. Um, and then there was another line in there that I really appreciated, which was, shall seek input from stakeholders with diverse backgrounds and perspectives. And so that, that recommendation that comes before the board, there's a responsibility that um, there's been diverse backgrounds and perspectives of stakeholders that have been sought input by the district in making that recommendation to the board. So that's what felt different to me because those things weren't actually called out in the policy before. In specific to how does that look different for elementary and secondary, um, I engaged in a couple conversations of how I felt it could look different, and I quickly learned that every site is a little different. Um, and so uh, there was some uh, question given to me of, could we, could we hear the policy that the board sets and then come back to the board with a, here's how we would actually handle an elementary curriculum as opposed to a high school curriculum. And I felt comfortable with that because I think those boxes will get checked a little differently for elementary than they would high school. Does that answer your question? Can I say, can I just add to that a little bit just because I, I think I know maybe a little bit what you're seeking. You're seeking procedure, right? How? What is the procedure that we're going to do to make this happen? And I think um, what maybe wasn't said is, as the board, it is our job to set the policy, but then it's the staff's job to decide on the procedure to follow that policy. So we set the policy and we let them know what it is we want, what we need through the policy, but then how they enact that policy, they'll come back to us with some procedures for how they're going to enact that policy. So we wouldn't actually sit up here and map out how the policy is um, performed. We set the policy and then it's up to them to map out how it's performed. And then do we, will we vote on the procedures that the district no, because that's what we, I mean, we set policy and, and Mr. Stock hires fabulous people to enact the policy and to figure out how it's going to go from there and, and communicates with us frequently so that he knows what we need and what we want and, and basically all the things we've been saying up here on the stand. So then it's up to them to figure out how to do it. But, I, but I how think, will they know what to do when we haven't, I, I just, I feel based on input and my own confusion to some degree after that, that meeting, that agenda item, how will they know what is adequate before going down a path if we are not going to explicitly go over this and how will it be clear to parents what the level of expectation for them is. I so mean, that's, because kind like, of, that's true for everything though. That's true for every policy and everything that we do throughout the district. And, and they will know because you will tell them and you'll tell 
um, superintendent stock in all of your meetings, how you feel about it and what's important to you. And, um, and he'll, he'll know through speaking with us in our individual meetings and also by the policy itself and the conversations we've had in setting the policy, what our expectations are. And then when does that get communicated to the public and to teachers who are going to serve on these? So that's also up to um, Superintendent Stock and um, Mr. Flowers and Mr. McDonald, and, and they do that part going forward. Okay. So really, I mean, there won't be any more clarity coming out of this well, today maybe not because here at the board meeting there but, might not be more clarity but, here at this on the stand but there will be much communication going out into the schools through the district i think i just i i think that all sounds good to have you know it's mapped out by district staff to come up with a way to execute these changes but the fact that we just approved a curriculum with minimal conversation that use basically the exact same procedures. Um, it, aside from the postcard and the parent information night, which could have been done for the other one, it's still that piece of it's different for elementary. And I, I don't know how, like what, what is it? Is it the is it the social topics that we feel we, you know, we're looking for anything that might be objectionable? I just, when it comes to the parent involvement, I just, they were, we did the same thing, but the outcome was so different. I think that we're discussing right here this policy and ed code doesn't specify K through six and six through 12. And so, this policy, I think, will be, well, we know it is because we've legally double-checked that it's compliant and we're, we're changing and what will be clear for our community and for our staff is we're changing the word from shall to must. We must involve teachers. It did say shall before. We must include the participation of parents and we shall encourage the participation of community members. So, what'd you say? Oh, that's okay. Um, so, I think that it'll be clear. Um, Superintendent Stock, do you want to add anything about, are you concerned about any of the clarity? Do you feel like this policy is going to be clear for our stakeholders? Uh, I think the, uh, the, the proposed changes regarding uh, the, the requirement of a, a parent involvement in, in the process, um, to me, is um, clear that that's, that's a required, not an optional piece. And through conversation the subcommittee had on the parent involvement process, um, it, w it was clear that the interest was um, that it, it's the very beginning of the process, not not through the pro, not part way through the process, not the end, but the very beginning, that parents fully participate in the committee, uh, the trainings, the input, the dialogue, and 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 and, and so that is the um, understanding I have, and so then that would be communicated as we um, work to reach out to parents to be involved. Is that th their involvement would include um, this level, anticipated number of days and meetings, and so they could fully uh, be apprised of that, and, and that that would, um, and then there was some conversation regarding working to have at least two parents involved, uh, because it's, it's hard to be a single person, whether you're a student or parent, and then looking at, um, because of the language on substantial teacher involvement, that. Um, constitutes a majority in a sense that, that there would be uh, really between that two and up to a third of the committee being parents. So there was conversation in the subcommittee around the operationalization of numbers and when in the process um, so that, that we would share that with any communication. Um, say, I know the boards asked us to bring forward another, uh, uh, to work on another elementary science uh, recommendation. And so if this were to pass, we would uh, in, in the fall uh, solicit uh, parent involvement and again apprise them. We expect this number of days and meetings and in process and have them from the very very beginning. Um, and, and and then that would we would share back with the board when we bring forth a, a future recommendation. Um, you know what the interests were, and we would hope that 
potentially um, not, not just staff could share, but even parents may choose to come and share when the recommendation is presented as well. So on the parent involvement piece, uh, I think through that conversation with the subcommittee, I feel I have some clarity on what the expectation um, is on the parent involvement. Can I ask, just brings up another question, because I did note down in the procedures what had been done. What if we don't get parents that have an interest or ability in committing two days of professional development and training, three days of review of eight curriculums, and then identifying two to pilot? And, you know, because I know we had some parents that are involved in science that came and said, I'll, you know, I'll contribute, but I know this, you know, are they going to take off work? I feel like that's like a limitation to getting people with, and are we looking for people with expertise? I can clarify what I shared at the ad hoc committee, because uh, naturally, right, the conversation goes into, wait, if this is the policy, how does it play out? If this is the policy, mm -hmm. how does it play out? Um, not that it would be appropriate for us to say, here's what has to happen with every single curriculum at every single grade, but some of these questions were asked, okay, but how would that play out? Um, and so when it came specifically to, well, what if a parent doesn't want to attend an eight-hour training? What if it, um, the policy specifically, I made sure it wasn't written in there that a parent had to be at every single meeting. Mm -hmm. They just had to be involved in the process as the recommendation is being formed. Um, and so that might be that, hey, there's an invite. Hey, there's this eight hour training. The reality is you, you may not have a parent that says, hey, I can go to every single meeting and training. But for me, the difference was, and, and I do think this was communicated and this was what would be very different for me was in the past it was, this process was started five years ago, however, the exact number of years, I don't have it in front of me. Um, and I had made a recommendation, could we could we pause? Can we just pull a couple parents together, have the committee meet one more time with a couple parents? I'm not comfortable with a recommendation coming to the board and then just letting parents tell us, do you love it or hate it? I want them to be a part of the recommendation, the selection process. So I, I don't mind going on record and being clear. I'm not saying that every single meeting that ever happens, a parent has to be sitting in the room. That would be absolutely ridiculous. Uh, we have professional learning that parents don't sit in. Um, and I, I don't think it would even be fully applicable for parents to always sit in that, right? Um, but for me, I think the verbiage is a substantial change. Um, it's in line with what Kellogg Code asks, and it calls out that parents must be included in the recommendation of the instructional materials for board approval. So that's the difference to me, Michelle. Also, Michelle, I, I know what you're saying. The, and, and I think no matter what we do, there's going to be what ifs. I think if, we, if there aren't parents knocking the doors down to get into the program, I think we'll have to do some legwork. I think there might be some recruitment involved, but... Um, I think it'll, yeah, Roger can handle it. Our, our district staff is, is amazing and they make things happen. So I think um, even if it's difficult, I, I, we've got thousands of parents out there. So I think a few parents will, will be able to recruit them. Okay. And okay, so just last on that, because so if, I think that's realistic, because my main concern for these questions is just presenting these changes are we approving something that is realistic and appropriate? And, you know, so then I'm looking, you know, at what they did. And so would we be expecting these parents to then fill out this, the same rubric that the teachers are working through to help score, you know, the, no. I wouldn't think so. I think the parent participation will be appropriate for parents, not, and, and not and for I, teachers. And I would say that process be a lot different could be different for English versus French versus math, you know, math or but we will tell or, the teachers so, at the outset of the committee I what would, the expectation is so that they don't do the work and then be told it's not enough can you address like some of the ways that you guys have included parents on other committees yeah, that would be helpful thank you once again going back uh when you and miss say um participated uh mm -hmm. at that time we were looking at at new health curriculum uh specifically for our i forget the official sex education <laughs> yeah. um at that time there was one in the state of california that met the requirements the new requirements therefore 
Uh, we didn't have to look at a ton of them because they didn't meet the requirements. We had one, so we did get uh, parents from all secondary schools that came together. We presented that material. We reviewed that. We did a q and I, I believe it was a couple meetings. Uh, and then uh, those parents approved it with uh, our teachers, and we moved forward with that adoption. Thank you. Okay. I think it's just new, and it hasn't happened yet. And so there seems like a lot of unknowns. But um, again, we have an awesome staff, and they'll, they'll make it happen. And we do have some public comments on this. Okay. So um, let's move to that. Uh, when you come to the mic, please state your full name, the city you live in, and the school your children attend. Uh, first up will be Jeremy Waddell, and on deck will be Teresa Landon. Jeremy, you will have two minutes. Good evening. Esteemed members of the board and Superintendent Stock, my name is Jeremy Waddell. I'm a teacher of Granite Oaks Middle School. I teach science and math. Uh, I also serve this district in a variety of ways uh, through RTPA, um, the newest bargaining team member, for instance, and uh, have been quite a bit of a collaborative success out here. Uh, even on bargaining, I found my world surrounded with parents, including one of my own personal parents that I had taught, uh, which had a lot of meaning to me. Uh, and actually, thinking back on my entire career here, I've worked with parents in this district all the way through. Uh, one of my first one of the first students I taught uh, was a science a daughter of a science teacher at Rockland High. I have taught students from secretaries, teachers, administrators, nurses, board members, uh, and all of those parents are on committees and are giving their input to the school that we work for. And I appreciate all of their values and their beliefs and what they bring to the table. And I wonder, will those parents count as parents when they step forward? Will Travis, will Emily be a parent on these committees? Or are we limiting it to people that are not already here, uh, giving their input as parents and teachers to our, 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 what we are doing? What worries me about the revision to board policy 6161.1 is that when we heard the announcement of it. It came at a point that didn't feel as collaborative as I've grown accustomed to. You looked at the parent input data around Amplify's 3.5 adoption, and you chose to interpret it in a way that others might not have. I've worked with parent data myself. I'm part of the data analysis team at Granite Oaks Middle School. Uh, we tried so hard to get parent input. Uh, we were dangling an opportunity to get um, a yearbook Jeremy, thank you. Thank you. That two minutes does go by kind of quickly. Teresa, you're up. Um, and after Teresa will be Bruce Yandel. Um, thank you, trustees. Um, I just wanted to say, um, kind of echoing what I heard before, um, parental engagement is an vital part of public education. Um, I do look forward um, to being a part of this process. I think that it is important that we're making these changes. Um, I think it'll be really exciting in the fall to get some parents in there, um, you know, to look at all the curriculum side by side. I'm really curious to see, you know, why, why the, the teachers unanimously chose Amplify. And, and I look forward to, you know, because they did that and they're the experts, if, if we agree with that, that that will then hopefully get a second day in court before you all. Um, because if you want to hear our voices, I hope they're actually going to be heard. 
Um, but again, parents should be involved. I just want to echo what he said in terms of it, and I, I do appreciate um, um, Tiffany Sent Health that you echoed the diversity requirement, that we want to make sure that all voices are heard, that um, all socioeconomic status, that we make sure that it's accessible, that it's not during the day when people are working, um, that that effort is placed to make sure that all voices of every member of our community is able to be heard and give, give that input. Um, and then I did have questions just because I was reading over it and hadn't seen all the changes. There was something about conflict of interest that got struck, and I'm not sure if that was a recommended from the CSBA or if that was from you guys, but um, I would think a conflict of interest would be something that would be important to, you know, if I work for a textbook company, you might not, I might need to withdraw myself. So I, that was just a random question that I saw um, that I would <laughs> love to know a little bit more. And then also the fact that the language change of, you know, shall to must, in, in ed code it is shall, 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 shall. So I just didn't know that this body had the authority to like change ed code, and I was just curious about that, because I, I don't know you know, the policy of us being able to supersede ed code or not, if that's, you know, allowed. Again, yeah. Um, so the, the uh, change regarding the conflict of interest piece came from the California School Boards Association um, and, and their legal counsel as well. So that was one that was not initiated and then the uh, uh, of enhancing a requ an ed code requirement from a, sh a shall with uh, in, in the must, uh, we can strengthen that. We just can't dilute it, as what our legal counsel informed us. And just to be clear, it was all done with legal counsel. Um, so up now is Bruce, and after Bruce will be Gemma Marizzo. And I have a daughter at Quarry Trail Elementary. And I live in Rockland. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm talking about this adoption program, and uh, listening to the meeting, it's actually kind of enlightening, but also confusing. The rationale: I wrote a letter, and thank you, Julie, for responding to our letter um, about the adoption process. But the explanation was confusing because the explanation was about not following the education code, but. Superintendent Stock said that we did follow the education code, so that seems to be a little bit false, um, or not, just simply not true. The other part about this whole um, adoption process is we have to look at the big picture. The big picture is, is that we've gone through four years of review process, and now if we're going to go back in and do another amplified review process of the science program, you're talking about probably hmm, maybe six years that our kids won't have an updated education program. That's a generation of elementary kids. That's not acceptable to me. That's not educational excellence. I moved here to become part of this community because of my, I wanted my daughter to have a great education. She's part of the dual language, and that's been great, and that's a risk. We took a risk, we did it, we're great, we love it. But at the same time, I want us to keep moving forward. We need to keep moving forward, and that means don't stop. Adopt a program, modernize our, our schools, keep things moving forward. Don't be scared. We believe in you, and we believe that you have a chance to write a situation that doesn't appear to be actually enacted yet. This discussion implies that the new policy hasn't been voted on or enacted yet, but you voted on that under the pretense back in April. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate you. All right, Gemma. Uh, my name is Gemma Marizzo. I'm a Breen mom and Granite Oaks mom. And, you know, Michelle is bringing up very valid points tonight that I really want to um, talk more about. I want to make sure in this review process that we understand that parents are not subject matter experts. I am a parent and I sit on as many committees as probably possible <laughs> in this district. And I understand that I'm not an education expert. This curriculum was written by, was reviewed by education experts that I trust fully and completely. And 
I think that there needs to be something in this new policy to understand who has what say in this, who has the weight, right? You don't want me to have the weight. <laughs> I appreciate you hearing my voice. I appreciate allowing me to be on these committees. I think it's very important. However, I am not a teacher. I am not an educator. It's important that we understand this when we talk about hearing the parent voice. Um, my kids are the generation that he mentioned. They have had no science in elementary school. They have not. And my daughter got to Granite Oaks this year as a seventh grader, and her eyes lit up because she loves science, and she has science every day. And that should have been happening in, in her elementary school education. It's so incredibly important that we have something better for our children. Um, it has been brought up tonight, um, Tiffany, uh, um, you have brought up that the review process maybe looks different at an elementary school level than it does for a secondary level. We need to think long and hard about why that is. I want to know why that is. Because in my mind, the review process and the parent voice should look the same across the board. We need to hear everybody's voices. And I want everybody to remember that you have echo chambers. You are all getting emails from different people. Gemma, thank you. Thank you very much. OK, board members, trustees, any other questions or comments before we vote? OK, is there a motion to approve the revision to board policy BP 6161.1 on selection and evaluation of instructional materials? So moved. Second. OK, first by Trustee Price, second by Trustee Sathoff. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sathoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, we will now move on to item 10.1, math data update. Beth Davidson, Director, Academic Improvement and MTSS.
just curious, and I don't know, do we have like Placer County? Do you get like a PCOE score or is it, and then are we on the same range, above, below? Just curious, because I know traditionally we, we compare to California and there's a lot of things we do very well, very, a lot better than the state, so I just have it more relative. So. Centile rank decreasing by five to 10 points in the area of mathematics from 2019 to And we move to the progression of exponents and then algebraic concepts, and that adjusting the pace of learning can be very, very challenging. Supplemental efforts, including intervention opportunities, high dosage tutoring, and summer programs are showing some positive gains. So let's look at a more local level. So we will start with uh, some of our initiatives this year around our emphasis and focus on student groups. So we'll start with the student group focus and then we'll move to the all student. So our five-year goal is by 2026, we will increase the percentage of students in grades three through eight meeting or exceeding math proficiency on the CASP by 10% for our targeted student groups. And we don't have CASP data yet, so we'll bring that data back to you in August, but we do have MAP data from the spring and some preliminary course pass rates for our integrated one through three courses at the high school that we'll share this evening. But our supports and services have really been targeted on math improvement for our student groups. This includes implementing um, English learner support, some specialized curriculum, including for our students with disabilities, training to support uh, our teachers in implementing that curriculum and instructional resources through our learning recovery model and math intervention courses. So our data is showing, we'll look at four different student groups. This first graph is showing our socioeconomically disadvantaged students. You can see this is a comparison a year over year from 2021 to 2023. So if we look over that two year span, we see a 15% increase in the number or percentage of students scoring at the met or exceeding levels on the MAP test from spring data. And our goal for our five years is to do a 10% gain. So we are making very, very significant progress. I'm incredibly proud of our staff and our students and families uh, for making such a tremendous amount of growth in this area. Our English learner group, we are seeing a 2% increase over two years, and I do want to note this data set does not include our novice English learners, so students who have scored a level one and been in the country for less than one year. We do not uh, ask that they take the CASP, the state exam, so we are reflecting similar uh, percentages here in terms of who's included in this student group. Then our students with disabilities, we're approaching our goal of that 10% increase over a five-year time span, so we see a 3% increase over two years. And again, for comparison's sake, in spring 2021, which is our baseline here, we did not include students in our special day class, our SDC uh, courses, so we have other means to monitor their progress that may be more appropriate in terms of determining uh, growth over time, including curriculum-based measures and IEP goal progress. 
So in order to compare apples to apples, we excluded our SDC students from the spring 2023 data set to match 2021 and 2022. And then our learning recovery program. So you can see spring of 2022 to spring of 2023, we're seeing a 2% increase over one year. So we are on target towards meeting our goal there. Yes, thank you. So, correct, yes, the blue is exceeding standard and the green is on level. So contributions to growth, so supports provided through our supplemental LCFF and other state and federal funding sources as Director Anderson has reviewed through the LCAP include interventions, so our walk to learn or shuffle model at elementary and our plus periods at our middle and high schools. We have learning recovery teachers and instructional aides that we will be continuing next year. Ninth grade class size reduction, our everyday math sections at the high school, so we're increasing the number of sections above the ratio. We have added program specialists to help facilitate our continuous improvement efforts. We have targeted tutoring for some of our student groups in need of tier three support, which we'll be expanding upon next year. Our common assessment work has helped us identify essential skills in order to progress monitor and make some instructional and programmatic decisions that best support students. We have introduced a data analytics tool that we're utilizing with schools, administrators, and teachers. Ongoing professional development for staff to support some of our students in um, targeted student groups. And then we are expanding our summer school to offer to high needs elementary students. So we'll look overall now. So our overall five-year goal is that we will increase the percentage of students in grades three through eight meeting or exceeding math proficiency on the CASP, the state exam, by 5% using spring 2021 as our baseline. And uh, thus far, student groups have been one of our main areas of emphasis for math improvement, but we are in the early stages of implementing and refining some large-scale tier one needs and support. So I'll share what some of that work has been and what we're looking for in terms of next steps. So these graphs are showing uh, the three-year timeline. So starting the lightest green color for 2020, 2021, and then that middle bar, the medium green is 21-22. Then the dark green was this school year, so this spring. And you can see overall as a district, we have a 1% increase. At elementary, there's a 1% increase. So we maintained from last year, but a 1% increase looking over that two year time span from the 2021 baseline. And middle school has increased by 2% over that two year time period. Looking at elementary by grade level, so this graph, you will look at the two bars side by side for fall to spring comparison by grade level. So for third grade, the percent on level or exceeding is 69%, so a 5% gain from fall to spring. For fourth grade, 66% are in the on level or exceeding, which was a 3% decrease from fall to spring. Fifth grade is at 63% for on level and exceeding, also with a 3% decrease. And then sixth grade at 65% on level or exceeding, and they had a 1% gain from fall to spring. This graph is showing growth, so whether students met their growth target that was established through MAP, through NWEA. So you can see the all student comparison is at 63% and then our highest grade levels in terms of the percentage of students meeting or exceeding their growth target is in grades three and six. At the middle school level, so similar information here. So the two columns on the left hand side are showing seventh grade scores from fall to spring and eighth grade on the right hand side from fall to spring. So we're looking at the blue and green sections here for exceeding and on level. 63% for seventh grade, so they showed a 6% decline decrease from fall to spring and eighth grade 66% meeting or exceeding with a 2% decline from fall to spring. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Um, as far as the declines, is that 
a concerning amount? Is there fluctuation? Like, are they getting diff tested on different content between the two? Or I guess, how do you kind of look at that and interpret that? So I would say that this is a pattern. So as students get older in our system, um, we tend to see either they're flatlined from fall to spring or that sometimes they show a slight decrease in their scores. And I think um, a difficult factor for us is student motivation. We, have, we are very heavy on assessment in the spring between the state test and using MAP, which helps give us a growth measure. So we really grapple with, we don't want to overassess students, but this really does give us kind of that beginning to end of year comparison so we can make programmatic and instructional shifts. Then growth for middle school, so the all students were at about 50% of students showing that they are meeting or exceeding their growth target, um, and seventh and eighth are, are in very close proximity there. And then on to the high school, so we know that grades can, are can, a... Can you bump back two slides then? So if we were, so for middle school, I think, what was our 20... What was our baseline 21 metric? Wasn't it like 58 something? And the goal for 5%, it'd be like 63. So if we're hovering around 64 and a half, 65, mm -hmm. rounded, mm -hmm. like all you gotta do is maintain what we're doing? Mm hmm. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. No problem. The middle school's made some great gains. It was really nice to see. Um, for high schools, we know that grades are a very strong indicator of student performance and that they're highly motivating to students. Our, most colleges and universities have really gravitated more towards grade data and away from assessment. Um, so our mass steering committee has really landed on this as a, the truest measure they can find of student achievement and to me measure and monitor the effectiveness of our programs and supports for students. So the graph on the left is showing a two-year comparison, so spring 2022 to spring 2023 for integrated one pass rate. So the two columns on the left-hand side are showing all students, and then the two columns on the right are everyday math. So you can see for the all, we have a slight increase in terms of the uh, percentage of students currently passing. And it's important to note here that we will report in August on final pass rates because we have a number of students attending summer school in order to clear their essential skills. So uh, we expect to see those, yes, we expect to see those percentages bump up. Then for integrated two, you can see our everyday and our dual teach models are showing significant growth in comparison to this time last year. And then for integrated three, our all student group had a slight increase, and then everyday math, just a slight decrease. So this is aggregated data showing the integrated one, two, and three courses together in terms of the pass rates by student group. Very promising here. So you can see the all student group, we have a slight increase, and then some pretty significant bumps uh, for some of our student groups where we've really targeted supports and services. And then this data is looking at just everyday math sections for integrated one, two, and three together by student group. So you can see our uh, everyday pass rate is those are some of our students who have historically struggled in the area of mathematics. So for their percentage rate to be hovering in the range of the all student group is impressive. And then you can see our socioeconomically disadvantaged, our English learners, including some of our redesignated students and our students with disabilities are all making progress. So we are working towards closing our achievement gap. Then this table sort of summarize uh, what Trustee Counter was asking about a minute ago. So if you look at the two green columns, this is comparing last spring to this spring in terms of current pass rates prior to any grade changes from summer school. So you can see in that second column there where it says spring 2022, end of course after summer school. So you can see that those percentages continued to grow uh, for our courses. So we are on track. So we are above 
where we were last year for integrated one and three and a slight decrease for integrated two. So in August, we will report out on those updated pass rates. Yeah, so I guess, that, and, and this is great data, so thank you. So if integrated three, if we, the goal is to get to 92 and we're roughly 96, how much of that is just the Hawthorne effect of shine and light or how much of it is like, like or whatever we did, major minor, like let it run. That's a great question. I think it's worth conversation after we finish this year with our integrated three teachers to see what their observations are about the students taking the course. Is there any difference in students enrolled in integrated three or did they make shifts in and terms then, of their instructional guess, practices again, and supports? In the inverse conversation then on integrated two, why such a decrease? If we started out at 83, we went down well at 6%. Was that just too much looking at it, too many questions asked? Too... So 83% would be- Was the baseline. After summer school grade changes. Yeah, yeah, I guess, what, so if I'm looking at spring of 23 right now, mm -hmm. and uh, we're at 77, mm -hmm. and when we baseline this, that was 83, so that's roughly a 6% decrease. But the 80, just keep in mind, the 83% of the baseline included any grade adjustments made from students attending Fair. summer school. Fair. So green to green, it's 77.5 it's to 77.3. We're fairly similar prior to summer school. And so, you know, what, what I think, as uh, Ms. Davidson mentioned, it, curious to see will we have a similar 82.6 or hopefully higher when we bring in the change. Yeah, and I guess in the same regard, it'd be interesting to see, I guess, I don't know how to get the feedback, so I'm just stretching. Now you can, kids with the summer school, is it just minimal amount of kids in the class, more focus, more attention, more whatever, that, that gets them to bump up that much? It'd be curious to see that. Because mm -hmm. if we're consistently about 77, and then we can hit that, um, maybe it's a, a modified everyday math <laughs> summer school or whatever. And we do, we do have additional sections of everyday for integrated three, which we did not have previously. But we will absolutely um, dialogue with our teachers about that. So in terms of next steps, again, our focus will be at the tier one level for next year. So we'll continue our supports at, for tier two and tier three needs. But our tier one supports will include professional learning opportunities. So we had a chance to collaborate with our TPA around uh, our professional development committee and our focus for next school year and asked uh, very specifically through both a survey and then an analysis that the committee did around what are you looking for in terms of how do you improve your practice and what supports can we offer to you as a professional so you can continue to grow and serve students in sort of this ever-changing environment we're in. We know that public education has experienced some of the greatest changes we've ever seen. And so huge credit to our teachers and our site administrators and um, leaders in the district for being adaptable and continuing to adjust their supports and services they provide to students who have needs that may be different than they've ever seen. At the elementary level, our tier one focus will be related to engagement, academic discourse, and really building that bridge between a conceptual approach to teaching and understanding by students to how does that transition to a standard algorithm that can be utilized. At the secondary level, we are doing some work around uh, building thinking classrooms, which is also related to engagement and really creating opportunities for students to think critically, to problem solve. And then some of our other um, PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act, change ideas that have resulted in the opportunity to scale and spread because they're showing promise are targeted use of ST Math, which is our digital math program at the elementary level. They offer a correlation with our map assessment so we can upload every student's map scores and it will give them targeted skill-based practice so that teachers can monitor how successful students are from a pre to a post test that standards align and it also gives us an effect size, so how much is it actually impacting the student's growth over time. And then lastly, we have fact fluency as a supplemental resource at the elementary level. So if you recall back on the elementary slides around some of our um, tier one achievement data, we will be targeting grades three, four, and five in terms of some additional supports and resources for students and teachers 
to really develop that fact fluency. So in third grade, we'll target addition and subtraction, in fourth grade, multiplication, in fifth grade, division. And again, emphasizing that progression from conceptual understanding to the utilization of a standard algorithm. And then we will continue to enhance new teacher support, training, and mentorship opportunities and provide ongoing training to our administrators as well. And then lastly, I missed this one, utilizing our common assessment. So now that we have them built at the elementary level, uh, helping our teachers to utilize them in a way that's informative in terms of classroom level shifts they can make and then programmatic shifts we can make at the district level. Um, now that we have them in place and they understand what they measure and have had the opportunity to make recommendations to adjustments to the screener so that they're more meaningful for the teachers, uh, I'm excited to see some of the vertical articulation conversations that have started through that work continue to grow in terms of where we might see gaps in our progression of learning and how our curriculum supports um, the development of those standards. So in August, we will bring back our CASP data so we can show true progress towards our five-year goals. Well, thank you. Uh, so many great slides in this slide deck. Um, I wanted to highlight two of them really quickly. The first was slide four. Um, and this is more of a highlight. The next one I do have a question on. <laughs> um, I just have to say, um, you know, although disappointing to see, um, you know, state of California, some of the concerns we're seeing, to see Rockland Unified not seeing the, that same loss of learning, that's phenomenal. Obviously, that is the result of the phenomenal programs, the staff, the teachers, and the great work that you're doing in many of these areas. And so um, I, I know you said that and kind of brushed over that, but I think it's important that the board take a minute and acknowledge that. That is an incredibly important slide. We're looking at state of California, you know, 2019, negative 0.42, a half a grade less in math scores. And yet we're seeing on here, Rockland Unified, a full grade and a half better. Um, that's huge. So I just want to take a minute to say thank you for that. Um, and then I wanted to also look at, um, just really quickly make a, a comment or question, slide 22. Um, great slide. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way for us to look at data. Um, what, what I'm trying to look at is I, I, I see in there the... I, I see the value of summer school and how it's helping many students and it's it's upping our percentages, helping students complete. Specifically, I'm noticing it more, um, if I'm looking at the math, in that integrated two area. Um, it looks like you're seeing you know, students that maybe are struggling to complete it during the year or pass it, but then utilizing the summer school services, they're able to then fix that grade or um, I don't know if you say fix or if they're replacing a grade or just completing a, a passing grade. Um, but I, I, I'm a little concerned or worried that we might have students that don't have the ability to participate in summer school. Um, and so I don't, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how to formulate the question to ask. I don't know the data I know to ask for, <laughs> but I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. I'm seeing on this where we're able to track that it looks pretty consistent, right? Spring 2022, prior to summer school, about 77%. Spring 2023, about 77% again. I'm assuming after summer school, we'll probably get up into those 80s too. Have we, have we looked at that a little bit more of trying to find more ways that we um, raise those rates pre-summer school? So they have... Um a mastery learning model so that the students have an opportunity within the school year, so before and after school and during plus period to get additional instruction, um, some targeted tutoring. This year we offered, two of our teachers offered before, before school tutoring okay. for students um, that was specifically targeted towards the integrated courses for students who were struggling to try to avoid going to summer school okay. so they could uh, <laughs> Well, I would assume there's a beforehand. group that would prefer not to, but then maybe there's a group that just are unable to. And that's possible. So we can look into any students who were not able or elected not mm -hmm. to attend summer school um, to see what those numbers look like. The summer school model is also a mastery learning model. So the students attend for as long as it takes for them to demonstrate proficiency in those identified essential skills. And once they do that, they can no longer attend. Gotcha. So I do think that that helps with access because a student may only need to be there for five days 
in order to clear their essential skills and demonstrate that proficiency. Got you. Okay, great. I just think just maybe like a little pin to put in of to continue to look. Would love to see us. We've made incredible strides. So this is in no way negating the incredible strides, but maybe moving forward that integrated two model of how can we kind of try to raise that specifically prior to summer school or students needing to attend summer school. But thank you very much. I do think it's a great option for them to have. I guess it, staying on that site, is there... Why would why would we go down in integrated three after summer school? In twenty two, I think those two need to flip flop. Yeah, that's actually a good so we went from ninety point five to ninety two point two. I apologize. Oh. It definitely didn't go down. Perfect. <laughs> Just want to make sure I was like, oh my God, am I reading that wrong? So, um, thank you, thank you for this. I appreciate the continuous improvement, the metrics, um, PDCA. Um, just, just the whole process of how we're using it, how we're looking at continuous improvement, how we're using metrics to, to drive things um, and measure the success. It's great to see, it's great to see when metrics work, and it's great to see when they don't, so we can make improvements and, and adjust. So I, I, I thank you. And then there was one I had a note on, but I don't see it, and, and I'm assuming in August it'll come around. We had a uh, greater than seventy, or one of our goals, greater than seventy percent would pass all the ESAs in high school. Are we, are we tracking to that anywhere, or did I write that metric down wrong a year or two ago? All that metric? Okay. We'll find but out. I'm happy to report on it if you Perfect. would like that information. Anything else? Go ahead. Thank you for all your work on this and all of the level of details. Uh, Roger had mentioned that it'll be interesting to see after these fourth through sixth graders start going to music every single day, what will happen to their math side of their brain. So. Yes. Just something. It'll be interesting to see. Thank you. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. Also, I'm wondering if there's a way to leverage the nine hour day that Catalyst is going to be uh, having the kids on campus. That might be a great time to get some more math in. <laughs> yes. And we didn't speak to that, but we will be utilizing <laughs> our building fact fluency kits and some other um, resources that we're utilizing during the day in our extend, expanded learning opportunities. That's spectacular. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. All right. If that's all. And I don't see any public comment. Have any come in? Okay. All right, then, um, we will skip right over 11.1, um, which is public comment, as we don't have any, and on to 12, which is pending agenda items. Trustees, do you have any items to be placed on the pending agenda? Okay, seeing none. The meeting is now adjourned.